Uh, good morning, everyone. Today is Thursday, May 12th. This is a full council session of the Montgomery County Council. We will continue our discussions and deliberations over the FY23 budget. We start with our item number one, uh, which is a bu budget consent calendar. There are 30 items on consent. Can I get a motion to accept the consent calendar? So moved moved by Councilmember Hucker, seconded by Councilmember Navarro. Uh, is there any discussion regarding the consent calendar? Just give our colleagues one minute so they can raise their hands. All those in favor of the consent calendar, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous among all those present. We move on to the next item on the agenda, which is item number 40, technically, uh, which is Montgomery College. I'd like to invite representatives from Montgomery College to come forward. Dr. Williams, good to see you. And I'll turn it over to the chair of our Education and Culture Committee, Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And um, uh, as the folks are seated from Montgomery College, uh, it goes without saying uh, just how important Montgomery College is uh, to our community. Um, we know all too well about the educational aspects and providing opportunities for individuals, uh, whether it's attaining new skills, uh, making sure that they have new certifications that are required by their jobs, uh, or just making sure that there's an affordable way for them to attain an associate's degree. Those things have always been represented by Montgomery College. One of the great things that makes this college unique is, is that its continued response uh, to the needs of our community is also an integral part of what it is that they do. Um, answering the call when it comes to our nursing shortage, answering the call when it comes to our focus on biotech and ensuring that we have career pathways that are set, even when it comes to something that we all think is just Second nature, which is child care, which Councilmember Navarro knows all too well, is a tremendous challenge throughout this country. And Montgomery College continues to answer the call in early care and education. Our police officers, we heard yesterday about the cadet program and the great things that happen when it comes to working with Montgomery College to ensure that diversity is on our police force. Montgomery College is truly answering the call on so many levels. And I wanna start off just by saying thank you. It is one of the reasons why we continue to support this institution and why we know that we are in good hands when we invest in something that we know gives us and our community so much in return. So with that being said, I wanted to give an opportunity for uh, Dr. Williams to open with a few words and then I'll turn it over to staff to walk us through uh, the budget. Uh, I will just say on the outset that I'm happy to see that we have a fully funded budget uh, that is incredibly important for us. We know that there are a couple pieces that are on our reconciliation list that we need to get off and uh, I remain committed to making sure that that happens as well. Uh, but that being said, let me turn it over to Dr. Jermaine Williams, president of Montgomery College. Thank you, excuse me, thank you, Council Member Rice. Uh, thank you, President Albernas. Thank you, the entire uh, County Council. It's so wonderful, as always, to, to be here with you. And I just wanna, again, express a, a moment of gratitude for, for all of you. And I uh, appreciate a, a few minutes on behalf of the board, students, alumni, faculty, and staff. Um, we're all expressing our, our appreciation to each and every one of you. Without a doubt, each of you, um, have changed lives with your commitment to Montgomery College. And um, Council Member Rice just eloquently illustrated some of those um, instances and how that, that occurs and has occurred. And because of you, um, as you heard, MC, um, you know, we fuel the economy um, with a skilled talent entrepreneurs and I'll share I'll go a little kind of individual here for just a few moments uh, that I have you um, like Sol Graham, a trailblazer who founded Quality Biological uh, now run by his daughter. Angela Graham, who sits on our Pick MC Foundation Board. Um, to today's alumni like Harrison uh, Carvalho, who had no access to technology at home and is now the owner of HMB Tech, an IT services forum, right? Or Ian uh, Latinsky, who is the CIO of Learn Zion, Zylin, or Shruti Mystery, a biomedical engineer at FDA. So just a, a few examples because of you, Employers can count on Montgomery College to meet their workforce needs for HVAC technicians to critical trial managers to 
nurses. Um, in fact, as of next week, to put a finer point, council member, on, on that uh, statement that you made, we expect to graduate 141 nurses next week. Um, thank you, thank you, and for this year, um, and that is you know, with an array complementing of other healthcare professionals urgently needed on, on the front lines. Um, I will add a, another point to that 141 as we um, just emphasize how Montgomery College fuels Montgomery County and our economy. Um, that's 141 graduates of the more than 4,000 graduates next week, more than 4,000 graduates. So I would now um, like to thank Rafael Murphy and Nicole Rodriguez Hernandez for their analysis of the college's request. As you know, we remain in unprecedented times and as a result, continue to make unprecedented decisions. Uh, that means holding tuition flat for a third straight year. Our faculty and staff, again, um, unprecedented, I don't think can be overused in this situation given our last few years, um, you know, took actions to ensure that nothing, not even a global pandemic, would stop MC from graduating nurses, IT, and biotech professionals um, that we just talked about. So I, I will say um, in that same vein, the FY23 pay raises are, are modest and sustainable. As a result, um, despite transitions and public health crisis, the college remains the county's faithful fiscal partner. Given the uncertainty of these days, the college engaged in conservative spending tactics and continued to advance fiscally prudent labor agreements and other expenditure controls for wages and benefits. Um, as I, I think everyone knows, and I think it, I can definitely reiterate, the Board of Trustees remains committed to finding a path forward to East County, along with all of us at Montgomery College. Together with you, MC remains prepared to continue to lead the way lead the way from a few classrooms 75 years ago at BCC um, to three campuses, uh, workforce development, continuing education sites, and community engagement sites, and now looking forward to an East County Educational Center that ideally within a few years or several years will become the actually fourth full-fledged campus. Montgomery College, with your help, continuing to lead the way. Um, as I really end up, you know, because of an investment, you know, by the county to advance this initiative, um, this imperative initiative for the college to move forward, you know, together we can finally take this uh, first uh, long overdue step, which I know the council, even though I'm new, I know that the council has long, long desired for the East County presence. And together we can unleash the talent in the East County. We can better serve our residents in the East County. We can make the points of connectivity in the East County that we know our county is, is yearning for and that our communities are yearning for. Together, we can expand the college's capabilities to deliver the skilled talent the economy needs, and I should say continue to deliver the skilled talent the economy needs, both for the moment of today and the moments to come. So in conclusion, thank you again for the opportunity to share a few words. We know that the college has opportunities. I would be remiss if I, as an educator, I didn't share that. There are opportunities that we acknowledge we're firmly resolved to address access challenges, um, to stabilize the college's revenues, and most importantly, to open MC's doors, whether that be physical doors or the virtual doors, wider to the county and the diverse communities that we serve. So um, I and we sit and stand before you, uh, both here and throughout the college, uh, eager, continue to be uh, dedicated and really appreciative of your partnership and look forward to the continued collaboration and coalition. So thank you, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Williams. And I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, highlight the fact of the continued work between you, the Board of Trustees, uh, all of your staff and our staff to come up with a resolution that works for us understanding some of the fiscal challenges that we face. And I really appreciate that, but that isn't anything new. Um, over my tenure now, as I uh, look to leave the council after 12 years, I've always seen that. Uh, under a myriad of different leadership, the key is, is that Montgomery College has always been a partner with this county. And I just wanna reiterate uh, for those future members that are going to be returning to please remember that Montgomery College has always been a great partner of this county in working with us when it comes to being flexible and understanding 
as we may face difficult future times uh, when it comes to fiscal challenges ahead. So I just want to make sure I state that. I did want to just a moment of personal privilege also say thank you because one of the things that we left out that's a big announcement uh, that's coming this weekend is a partnership between Montgomery College, Montgomery County Public Schools, who we'll hear from shortly, uh, Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation, and this county. The Ignite Hub, uh, powered by our Montgomery King Code program through a partnership with Apple Corporation, is going to open this Saturday at the Rockville campus Manakee, this weekend on Saturday. This is huge. This is something that I think everybody should be talking about because it shows the level of commitment that all of these different departments have put forth in terms of putting our community and our kids first. Continuing to have access with one of the largest companies in the world and being able to say that we're committed to making sure that the doors are open for career pathways when it comes to technology. And so I wanna say thank you to you and all of your staff who have done yeoman's work, especially Dr. Rye, uh, Mr. Greenfield and others uh, who have continued to work so hard to make this a reality. So thank you again and congratulations ahead of time. We'll be able to celebrate more on Saturday. So with that being said, I certainly wanna to turn to Ms. Rodriguez Hernandez and thank you as well as Ms. Uh, McGuire for, again, a phenomenal packet that sums up all of our decision points. Uh, and before that, I just wanted to thank my colleagues on the Education and Culture Committee, Councilmember Navarro and Councilmember Juwando, for always making sure that we have our community in our sights as the first things that we consider in terms of how to move this county forward. So with that, Ms. Rodriguez Hernandez. All right, good morning, council members. Thank you. Uh, so happy that we have our partners from Montgomery College and OMB here today for this discussion. Today, the council will review the committee's recommendations for the Montgomery College's FY23 operating budget, as well as a few technical amendments to three projects within the college's FY23 to 28 CIP. So we'll start with the operating budget, make a recommendation or preliminary decision, and then move to the capital budget. The committee Committee recommends a total appropriation of $321,251,413, which fully funds the college's request. That includes a county contribution of $147,649,696, which is a $2 million increase over the FY22 approved and maintenance of effort. In addition, the committee added two tranches of $500,000 each to the reconciliation list. These addition would increase the county contribution in the current fund. And while the council cannot restrict current fund expenditures in, um, for the college for how they use it, uh, the committee did mention that it could be used to support the East County Education Center. So starting with the key issues, uh, first is the college's projected unbalance for fund balance for fiscal year 23 is $28.5 million, which is around 19.3% of their um, of the formula of the county's reserve and select fiscal policy set for the college, which we set at three to five percent. Uh, for this reason, the committee recommends reappropriating an additional five million and sixty-one thousand dollars in fund balance to fully fund their request. The college also notes that it's. Additional expenditures this year include um, increases in high-risk insurance premiums, additional scholarships, the pay adjustments and wage increases that Dr. Williams mentioned, and of course, that East County Education Center. For staffing, they've requested 10.5 new full-time employees, and those will be used for the East County Education Center, enrollment and student access specialists, public safety officers, building services, administrative aides, and information technology specialists. As we've discussed for a while now, the committee recommends holding a future work succession on community college enrollment nationwide and specifically at the college. As the college has been facing declining enrollment since the Great Recession and tuition rates um, have remained constant since fiscal year 20. Tuition revenue serves as the second highest funding source for the college with the county contribution coming as the highest. And we want to make sure that we can resolve any issues of fiscal strains and the college's financial picture as we keep moving forward uh, into the next few years. And finally, for COVID-19 funding, the college has received approximately $77 million and has expended around $57.6 million as of March 31st, 2022. And there's a, approximately a remaining $19.4 million. 
And so with that, again, just summarizing, the committee recommends a total appropriation of the $321 million, which fully funds the college's request, with a shift of $5,061,000 in fund balance to meet that full fund request, and the two tranches of $500,000 on the reconciliation list to support the East County Education Center. Well, thank you very much, Ms. McGuire. So, uh, Mr. President, that is a unanimous recommendation from the Education and Culture Committee. I will just stress again uh, our insistence upon making sure that to continue uh, the uh, East County Education Center moving forward, we do need those two tranches of $500,000 off of the reconciliation list to support this very important project. Uh, but that is a part of our committee recommendations that were unanimous. And so I turn it back to you, sir. Thank you, Chairman Rice. Uh, just a quick point of privilege in the audience. I see former council member George Leventhal and HHS committee chair for life. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for your service, Mr. Leventhal. It's good seeing you. Um, and Dr. Williams, thank you. I actually had the opportunity to speak to that graduating class of nurses through a Zoom call just a few weeks ago. Um, and I was immensely impressed with how that class so beautifully reflects the diversity of the communities that they are going to serve and they asked fantastic questions uh, about the county's commitment to ensuring we support our nurses beyond just graduation and uh, we are committed to doing so and so um, i do want to thank the college's steadfast leadership in so many different areas i'm particularly excited about the east county initiative which i think is going to be a game changer on many levels and i really want to express my appreciation to staff and to the committee for its work so we have a committee recommendation before us. Uh, can I get a motion to accept that committee recommendation? So moved. moved by Councilmember Hucker, uh, seconded by Councilmember Rice. Uh, any discussion? Councilmember Hucker. I, just as the local council member for the East County, uh, I very much wanted to uh, thank you for your leadership, uh, Dr. Williams, and um, thank the Education Committee for their uh, consistent support, uh, each one of you, for the East County Center. Um, that's something, boy, we've been talking about for years. Um, it is clearly the right place uh, to expand Montgomery College. It's the place where most of our young people and career changers could take advantage of it, where they live in an environment without enough transportation options that um, deter them from getting to your other campuses. Um, and it's, it's not just the right thing to do for our residents, it's absolutely the right thing to do for our economy to meet the needs of our employers um, and the, this, particularly in this tight labor market we have and the rapidly changing needs of our um, employers, including in the green construction space, which um, I, I sponsored and the council passed legislation on a, a pre-apprenticeship program earlier. Um, the work that could be done in East County is just absolutely tremendous. I think we only appreciate a fraction of it at this point, but um, I'm really grateful to you, Dr. Williams, uh, to Dr. Pollard, to all your trustees and everybody on this council for pushing this forward, because it's a great thing, not just for our county, but for the, the whole state. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councilmember Navarro. Yeah, I mean, I, I do want to also take this moment to um, just express my overarching admiration and appreciation for the leadership of Montgomery College, past and present, um, and also for the extraordinary leadership of education committee um, chairs, such as former council member Valerie Irvin and now council member Rice, who absolutely uh, took the reins and continue to build upon what had been put in place because to me that has been one of the most uh, enjoyable aspects of serving on this body is that we build upon what has already been done. It's not as if every time there is a change, every new term and there are new council members, somehow things get put on the back burner and they go away. Um, all of this work has been built upon what has been done in the, in the past. Many of the things that the HHS committee does now, as it was just mentioned, was built upon the extraordinary leadership of, of Council Member George Leventhal. And that is important because that sends a signal to our constituents that this work is the kind of work that is strategic and that does leverage the capacity that we have put in place. The East County Montgomery College, uh, you know, presence um, is one that has been very well documented. I made sure that we included in the packet the proposal that I sent. I think it was almost a decade ago. But the, but the important part of that is that it was a partnership that also looked at the totality of what was needed. We needed a hospital. 
You know, we needed uh, the White Oak, the Viva White Oak project to be passed, and we need to make sure that becomes a reality. This piece is so critical because time and time again, we hear about how young people in the east part of the county cannot even have, a they can't have access to internships because we don't even have a lot of job centers in the east county. Transportation has always been a challenge. And so when we talk about these things, these are issues that MCPS leadership understands because they stand in the way uh, to make sure that our young people have access to opportunities are things that Montgomery College understands because that is your job, right? You are the creators of opportunity and access to opportunity. And it makes sure that everyone understands that it takes that kind of approach. It has to be holistic. And so we're elevating the East County today in a significant way because it's long overdue. But I do know that throughout the county, we will continue to connect those dots. And so, you know, again, since I'm on my long awaited farewell tour, this will be my last time sort of raising my hand on this operating budget piece um, and, and capital um, budget. I, I, again, just, just really want to express my gratitude because it has been so fulfilling on a personal level uh, to know that we do live in a county where folks are absolutely dedicated and eager to constantly find ways to enhance what we have, to leverage what we have, to scale up what we have. Uh, and we must not stop because the challenges are actually even uh, more pronounced right now, given what we've just gone through with COVID. Um, but uh, Dr. William, you're obviously very well positioned to take this to the next level. And, um, and so again, just, just thank you to everyone that makes this happen all the time. And our amazing central office staff that always makes sure that we have everything everything uh, in order. <laughs> so thank you too. Thank you. Councilmember Juwanda. Thank you. I'll be brief. One of the great things about being with the two members of my committee that are on their farewell tours is that they say everything I need to say before I say it. So I want to thank them uh, for their partnership. It's been fun over the last four years to be at the helm and always find consensus to support our students and our families. Uh, and Dr. Williams, I'm good to, glad to see you picked the seat that you were in last time, like we talked about. You're in it. Um, uh, inside joke there. Uh, but uh, very happy about this, happy about the whole project, happy about the math and science building that the, and the Leggett's name. I'm happy about uh, the nurses and the 4,000 graduates, uh, all the programming that you're picking up, the, the work that we've been talking about to increase retention for uh, students of color, particularly black male students, a project that Dr. Pollard started uh, and that we're going to pick back up and make sure we uh, get across the finish line. Uh, the East County campus will play an integral role in that uh, and other things. So just so excited about what's ahead. Happy that we were able to work out this budget in a way. And, and you have my commitment to work very hard with my colleagues to get that other million dollars off the reconciliation list so that you can move in earnest. And I know you're already well on your way for that East County campus, which is going to be a life game changing for that part of the county and for the whole county, because we all do better when we all do better. So thank you for your work. Thank you for your colleagues. Thank you to our staff and look forward to uh, approving this budget. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. All right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of the committee recommendation, please raise, raise your hands. And that is unanimous. Go Raptors. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Williams. <laughs> oh, we have we have one more piece, actually. Okay. It's just um, a cleanup. And so I'll turn to Ms. Uh, Rodriguez Hernandez. But we have some technical adjustments for the CIP portion. So I'll turn that over to Ms. Rodriguez Hernandez. Yes, thank you. This won't take much time. Thank you, Chair Rice. Um, we do have a few technical amendments. The first I'll mention is for the East County Campus CIP project. So we were talking about the East Education, East County Education Center, which will launch that campus. Um, and this is for their CIP project. The state is authorizing an additional $2 million um, in state aid for fiscal year 24 for this campus. So we're going to reflect that in the PDF. And then the other two are related to the um, related Tacoma Park Silver Spring Math and Science Center and the Rockville Student Services Center. We discussed the substantive changes at our previous council work session. And now with the final state aid awards, we're just dotting our I's and crossing our T's with the final amount. So just reflecting some small changes there. So council staff recommends approval of all these technical amendments. And so I move those technical amendments, Ms. President. Moved by Council Member Rice, seconded by Council Member Jawando. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, council members. Thank you so very much. 
Terrific. That moves us on to the next item on the agenda, which is uh, Montgomery County Public Schools. I will once again, uh, well, give everyone a minute to come forward. And once again, I'll turn it over to the chair of our Education and Culture Committee, Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And as uh, our great partners from Montgomery County Public Schools are seated, um, you know, I'm going to just take a moment because I can, um, since I'm the chair, to just reflect back on this unique opportunity. I mean, being born and raised here in Montgomery County, coming through Montgomery County Public Schools, and now sitting at this day as working with Montgomery County Public Schools over the past 12 years to ensure that some of the great things that I was able to experience along with my classmates uh, can be enhanced and expanded to so many others that look like me that come from different circumstances. I reflect back on the fact that being the son of an educator uh, and having two parents at home uh, who had the opportunity to spend time with me, I was privileged. I was privileged even though I came from family that came from the rural South and Dr. McKnight knows this all too well, knowing exactly where my family hails from, um, a very poor area. And when I think about um, the challenges that our children still face, even this morning, as I reflect on a young 16 year old's life that was lost due to violence, I know there's so much more that we can do about continuing to instill the opportunities and bright futures that our children have ahead of them. But as we talked about last night in the East County Citizens Advisory Board meeting where we were focused on education, our kids can't be what they cannot see. We need to make sure that we continue these great opportunities uh, and put them in the faces of our kids so that they realize that there's something more than losing their lives each and every day. That's why this budget is so important. That's why our teachers and our staff, administrators are so important. That is why over half of our budget is invested in this work. Because we know, just as we talked about with Montgomery College, this is truly about saving lives. The unique programs that are offered in Montgomery County Public Schools that have continued to expand have been able to reach children where they are and help them to see themselves in a myriad of different pathways that were not offered when I was in school. That's incredibly important. We're also going back to some of those things that unfortunately some of our parents thought were beneath our kids because we were in Montgomery County. I remember all too well uh, when folks would say, oh, you know, what, Craig, you're in the magnet program. Why do you want to take shop? It was one of the classes that I took as an, uh, as an option for me. And, you know, my dad always told me, my dad who was a Marine Corps veteran and who worked with his hands, his father had a cement uh, uh, company growing up and um, worked on aircraft. Uh, it's the reason why I loved airplanes uh, and ended up going to Naval ROTC at University of Illinois. Um, those are the kinds of things that, again, um, were kind of lost, uh, and we're getting them back. Uh, my wife, uh, and she hates when I talk about her, but sweetheart, I'm sorry, um, who went to high school in uh, Prince William, Virginia, and who got her cosmetology license uh, in high school. She didn't go to college. Um, she has a fantastic salon, is actually in the process of building out her own salon in downtown Bethesda. So I say to folks, you know, um, when you think about saying that there are limits uh, in terms of different career pathways, it's so untrue. Um, there is so much opportunity regardless of where you go and what you do. I'll remind you to look at your uh, bill the next time you have a plumber come over. Look at your bill the next time you have your car serviced. 
uh, and look at that hourly rate. I promise you it's probably challenging the rate that you make in your salary. Uh, the reality is, is that part of that is shared with a company. But guess what? If they start their own company, that money is theirs. And those are the things that we are trying to encourage our children to be able to do. And it comes into play when we're looking at new technologies and new ways to ensure that our children have access. Uh, this digital divide is something that we are looking to close. And via COVID, we saw Montgomery County Public Schools step up to the plate immediately, issuing Chromebooks to every single student, making sure that they had MiFi devices for connectivity. And while we know that it wasn't as good as broadband, the reality is, is that it ensured that so many of our kids who didn't have connections would have them. Our teachers stepped up and trained themselves to be able to figure out ways to reach our children through computers instead of in person. Everyone stepped up to the plate. And now we have an opportunity to try and expand upon some of the great things that we've learned via COVID and double down on those efforts as we look to continue to ensure that those opportunities are there for all of our kids. So I wanna take a moment of personal privilege like I did um, with Montgomery College to just say thank you. Thank you to you, Dr. McKnight, to your predecessor, Dr. Smith, um, who have continued to work through this very difficult time to make great things happen. To you, President Wolf and the Board of Education and your colleagues who have continued with great leadership not only in terms of ensuring that the policies and uh, those that are set forth are conducive to supporting our kids, advocating for budgets that are commensurate with that work, uh, but then also showing the community and engaging with them as we make these tough decisions was incredibly important. And last but certainly not least to our teachers, to our support staff who did the work, who rolled up their sleeves, who spent extra time to make sure that they spent time with our kids knowing that this was a difficult time for them, that so many of them, it was not a supportive uh, environment in terms of how they would best learn and still trying to figure out how to make it happen. And we know that, look, the numbers are the numbers. We know that we didn't reach everyone in this tough time that we had. We know that some children had some challenges during that time frame, but we remain committed to making sure that we can do all we can to get them back on track. Uh, and that is the important part of acknowledgement that we're not perfect, uh, that we still have things that we can do better, things that we can do more of. And I hope that this budget uh, will be seen as a way in which reflects that initiative. So with that, uh, I want to turn it over to President Wolf, President of the Board of Education. Actually, oh, I'm sorry. Yep, uh, Councilmember I, I apologize. Rice, a couple um, colleagues to my colleagues queue. first. I apologize. Uh, Councilmember Navarro. Fault. Yep. Thank you. Um, so, wow. Um, so Montgomery County Public Schools is the reason why I moved to Montgomery County uh, as a very young woman who was about to be a mom. Um, absolutely did my research and realized that Washington, D.C. wasn't going to cut it for us. <laughs> and it had to be Montgomery County because of the extraordinary schools. Um, and I particularly wanted to make sure that my daughters, who are Afro-Latinas, at that time it was just one, but then another one came our way, uh, had the opportunity to be educated in a surrounding and an ecosystem that reflected not just uh, their surroundings, but, but the world, quite frankly. Um, given that our household is, is quite international in many ways. And um, boy, did they really take advantage of so many opportunities. They are very successful young professionals uh, doing marking, you know, placing their marks uh, in the world right now in the tech industry. Um, but I also credit Montgomery County Public Schools for the reason why I am sitting here. Because the reality is that while there were so many opportunities, I also began to experience very much firsthand uh, the challenges. Uh, as, as I tried to be involved in PTA, as I did you know, volunteering in the classroom as a bilingual volunteer, as I tried to do whatever I could to provide some support, I could recognize and see some of the uh, missed opportunities. And at that time, the demographics were not what they were right now. Um, and so, that's, that's, that's what really led me to, to, to apply for that appointment to the Board of Education. I never thought I would go into public service in this way. 
uh, and somebody said to me, and this is what made it happen, somebody said to me, you can't continue to complain about the challenges that you see unless you're willing to step up. And Councilmember Leventhal remembers that because I went into his office and I was like, hey, I would like to apply for this thing. And it's like, okay, cool. Um, but I say all of that because that was 2004. And so, yes, we have really done some extraordinary things. At the same time, the things continue to pivot and change in front of us and things become even more challenging. We have done extraordinary things. At the same time, I literally can change the date of my letter when I applied for that appointment and the issues are still the same. And so I want to elevate that because I think we also need to be frank and open to acknowledge and say to our staff, our extraordinary teachers, our support service personnel, our administrators, our parents and our students, that we see you and we see the struggle. We understand that these are not regular times. Let's just not kid ourselves. This pandemic has been transformational on so many, so many levels. Some things we are aware of and many other things we are not. And so I just want to really, number one, thank you, especially members of the Board of Education for stepping up because I was there and I remember when, you know, folks thought that we just literally just went there to chill out a little bit. It is, a, it is really hard work. And, and, and you, Dr. McKnight, for, for really stepping into this moment, and everyone, um, because it is not going to be easy. I submit to you that there are challenges that we have never faced before. And that is going to require amazing innovation, extraordinary willingness to pivot very quickly, because we are in a race against what could be a very destabilizing time for our school system. And we know because the studies have shown that once a high functioning school system starts to go downhill, it's very difficult to steer it back no matter how much money you throw at it. So we have an opportunity here, but we also have a big challenge. And I can only say that I feel very confident that because of this leadership and because of these, this body and because of the residents that we have who are always so interested in doing their part, we can be that model because the country is struggling as well. And we know that. So I wanted to, to, to say that as a, you know, remark number 1000 on my farewell tour that it has been a privilege not only to have served on the Board of Education, but also to have been able to serve on the council because what really motivated me to come to the council was understanding that it's not just what happens in the classroom. A lot of what happens outside the classroom is what has the real impact that all of you have to navigate, that these students are not just affected by what happens there in that interaction, but whatever else is occurring in their in their healthcare space, in their economic sufficiency space, and all of those spaces. And now you have to do it with a school, with a student body that is so extraordinarily diverse where over 160 languages are spoken. No joke. But this school system is our jewel. This is why people choose to come to Montgomery County. So it's also connected to the quality of life in our county. So no pressure. <laughs> but <laughs> but again this is the group that can do that. This is the team that can do it. And um, so with that, just humbly, I, I do want to express my gratitude for not only helping um, educate my extraordinary daughters, Anais and Isabel, but also for everything you do uh, to serve our over 160,000 students. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. Um, pleased to see each of you here today. Thank you. I just want to express I am so worried now. We have lost so much ground in the past several years, as we all know. And, and virtual learning did not produce learning. And our kids are behind where they should be. And we have our work cut out for us to help them accelerate through their path. Each kid on an individualized path. Some are fine, we know. Some are fine. Many are behind. So um, I will just, you know, we have to work together with a sense of urgency to help our kids accelerate out of where they are today. 
and I know that's your that's your mission, and you're you're working on that. Um, and there's a lot of plans in your budget that reflect that. Uh, but I just want to just sound a very general note as a parent. I am very concerned about this county's success, and I think we need to redouble our efforts. And so, look forward to, to hearing about that today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Hucker. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President. Um, congratulations, Dr. McKnight, on uh, on being named super permanent superintendent and, and the uh, approval of your contract. Uh, great work, Ms. Wolf, and all your colleagues on the board. Um, I really look forward to continued work together. I know all my colleagues uh, feel the same way, and um, and are very much looking forward to it. Um, and thanks for all your uh, service during the very difficult last two years. Uh, just a couple questions, because I'm not lucky enough to ser serve on the powerful education committee. Uh, I think I was waitlisted. Um, if we can hold off on questions, oh, until questions? after. Yeah, Fine, this, these were just opening comments. Got it. Colleagues that have Thank requested you. to make some opening comments. Happy to. Okay. Um, great. Then why don't we jump right into the packet then and turn it, I'll turn it back over to the chair to help facilitate the conversation. Well, thank you very much. I would like to make sure that we give an opportunity for Dr. Uh, uh, McKnight and President Wolf. So we'll start with the president of the Board of Education, uh, Brenda Wolf. And you just press the button at the base of the microphone there. There you go. You know, this is the first time I've been in this building to do this, so thank Welcome. you for that. Welcome, President <laughs> Wolf. It, you, you know, it, it's 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 interesting that we take this for granted in terms know, of but where it's we been are. Two years, That's... I haven't haven't done this. So, good morning, President Albernaz and members of the Montgomery County Council. I, I just want to stop here and thank um, uh, Council Member Navarro for something she said, and that is that this is a community effort. To our success is going to be based on the success of this community. I keep highlighting that for people because MCPS cannot do this work alone. So thank you for bringing that up. And thank you for the opportunity to discuss with you the fiscal year 2023 <clears throat> operating budget for Montgomery County Public Schools. The FY 2023 operating budget is the result of internal and external feedback along the extensive analysis of our programs and outcomes. The FY23 budget request ensures that students and staff have the necessary resources to learn as we continue to deal with the impact of the pandemic. The budget includes investments in mental health supports, enhancing safety and security, and in the foundational skills of literacy and mathematics. The top priority of this budget is maintaining the high levels of achievement for our students who need enriched and accelerated instruction and to eliminate the opportunity gaps, which we know most heavily impact our Black and African American students, our Hispanic students, our uh, students who live in poverty and our limited English language students. We look forward to being able to answer your questions today. Um, we also thank you for your partnership. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. McKnight. Thank you, thank you President Wolf, and good morning. It's so good to be here. Thank you for having us, President Albernose, um, Education and Culture Committee Chair. Councilmember Rice, Councilmember Navarro, we will miss you. It has indeed been a pleasure to work with you over the past couple of years, one of the most trying times in public education that we've ever experienced. And it has been your dedication and knowledge and support of everything around the needs of education that's been able to help us shepherd through that process. So very grateful. Councilmember Jawando, look forward to continuing to work with you um, as a partner. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yes, <laughs> fingers crossed, um, moving forward. And the entire council, um, it is truly a privilege to be a part of Montgomery County when you have a council who knows and understands the importance of partnership in a community, who understands that the education of students is going to be the core of what continues to move our community forward, and I thank you for that. Um, Councilman Reamer, you were absolutely right. We have a challenge before us, and it's something that we all should be worried about. And I, I challenge us to say that we probably should have been worried more a long time ago. Because here's the story of equity. We've been looking at this for years before 
I was here probably before many of you were here. It's a historical issue that we have to turn on its head in Montgomery County and quite frankly across the nation when we see the same groups of children who represent negative at the top of the bar on certain issues and for positive types of things that we look at, we see those same students represented on the lower end of that bar. We all should be very worried about that and should say, what is it that we need to do in Montgomery County to change that? Now, with that said, that's a great challenge, but I am confident that we'll get there because we are Montgomery County. And I've lived it, I've experienced it, and I just talked about the power of partnership in this community, and that's what's gonna help us get there. So while it's a challenge, it's one that I welcome. I know the Board of Education is up to it and ready to roll our sleeves up, and it's because our children and our families deserve that. And that's the commitment that we bring forward to be innovative, to be, um, you know, breaking all types of barriers that have existed for our children. And so while we're doing that, what we have to be very astute to is that for our students who have been thriving and doing well, continuing to make sure that happens for them too. It's not one or the other. And this is what equity is all about, giving every child, every student in the school system what they need and deserve to have. And one priority shouldn't compromise the other because they're all children. And so um, I look forward to us continuing to have our discussions about how this budget is going to hold all of us accountable for being innovative and closing those gaps that we're talking about because we're going to do it. And we're going to be able to tell the story of what we've learned and figured out in building that. Um, I'm happy to be joined here with staff members who have been a part of helping to build that vision. Dr. Dawson, Rob Riley, Michelle Rubin, and many other staff members who are here sitting behind us and our association partners are here too. And I appreciate them being here because what we know is uh, everybody has a part to do in this journey. If you are an employee in the school system, if you are a member of this community, you have a responsibility in the great challenge that we've experienced over the past couple of years to move us in the right direction. And it is going to in fact take all of us. So with that, I wanna say I thank you for the opportunity to talk about the budget yet again. My comments will not be as long as they were the last time in which I went into much great detail about every part of the budget, um, but I wanna say thank you so much for investing in the school system as you always do. Um, we are very grateful for the support that uh, the Education and Culture Committee reflected on the vote that you took on April 29th to support the needs of the school system in our operating budget. We did institute spending restrictions for the remainder of this fiscal year to help close, close the gap of the budget that was uh, tentatively adopted by the Board of Education in February 2022. We came and talked about the challenges of that when we were here before, but we also went back and said, you know, what can we do? Um, and so we've been good stewards of going back, assessing and looking at ways to be able to um, look at how we could restrict spending so that it would not in any way harm what we were trying to accomplish for the rest of this year. And I want to thank our budget team and our staff for coming together and figure, figuring out innovative ways to do that. Um, the driving factors in preparing our budget maintain to be successful practices that have led to strong student achievement and investing in new strategies to, in support, our, to support our students. I will tell you the last uh, few weeks I've been participating in listening sessions in our community. And our parents, our community members are amazing. I've met parents who have children in the school system, parents who, grandparents who've had children in the school system who've graduated and now have grandchildren. And some of our community members who said, I don't have children in the school system, but I'm worried, I'm concerned. And most importantly, what can I do to help? And so we've been having that conversation around the three priorities that are aligned with the school system strategic plan our DSIP plan, which involves many community members, and my three priorities as the superintendent sets for, set, setting forth the vision of the system, and that is reestablishing trust through communication, focusing on wellness of students and employees, and third, focusing, refocusing on equitable teaching and learning. And even when I think about that second priority for wellness spaces for our students and staff, Again, I bring up the partnership opportunities that our council president and others have said, you know, we've got to come bring everybody to the table together because it's a community issue of wellness. The children are just a reflection of what's happening in the community. 
And so that means every organization within our community will come together for us to continue to focus on how we implement the priorities for a wellness for our students and our staff. So with that, I'll say that our FY23 operating budget continues to be centered on our core purpose of preparing all students to thrive in their future and to graduate, graduate with a deep knowledge of how they can prepare for their academics and most importantly, a complex world that will look very different in many ways as a result of COVID-19. And so we're projecting the future and thinking about what those new professions will be and what they will look like as we've seen the world shift in so many different ways in terms of how it provides services to our community over the past two years. And for that, while the pandemic was difficult, I'm grateful that it pushed us into spaces to really say we need to evaluate how we do things. And I personally believe that that probably needed to happen to push century old education practices in the direction in which we're headed. So we are very fortunate for the federal government providing us our relief funding is what I'll call it, all of our ESSER spending so that we could respond to the needs of the pandemic and focus on uh, needs of mitigating learning loss, well-being for our students and keeping our schools safe. But I will emphasize every time I come forward and say it was relief funding. So here are the dates that stand out in my head. ESSER 1 will expire September 2022. ESSER 2 will expire September 2023. And ESSER 3 will expire September 2024. And so those states resonate in my head because as we think about how we're being innovative right now and we're using the relief funding to help us do that, we also have to be stewards of looking at, okay, what, how will we learn from what those investments are? Know how, what we're getting an investment for? Um, is it paying forward in the way that we would like for students? And then how are we gonna manage that shift over the next couple of years? And we have to think about that right now. So with that said, I will stop. Uh, sharing my comments. Um, thank you again. I end with the same gratitude I started with and I'm here with the staff and we're prepared to answer any questions that you may have if you have any regarding our operating budget. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. McKnight. And what I'd like to do, Mr. President, is turn to uh, now to Ms. Rodriguez Hernandez and uh, thank both her and Ms. McGuire um, for, again, a phenomenal packet as we go through the points. Uh, we can then uh, ask for comments or questions based on the particular categories. And then if there's something generic in terms of questions, we can save those for the end and then direct those to uh, our guests as well, because I know that we have pretty much all leadership from uh, Montgomery County Public Schools in the house today. So it's a, a great uh, opportunity for us to be able to answer any of those questions that folks may have. So with that, Ms. Rodriguez Hernandez. Thank you again. Good morning, council members. I'm so happy we have our partners from Montgomery County Public Schools and the Office of Management Budget here today for this discussion. On April 20th and April 29th, the ENC committee met to review MCPS's operating budget for this upcoming fiscal year. April 20th was a time to have really in-depth conversations around the fiscal um, sustainability and the future of MCPS's budget, as well as understanding the increases that were recommended on both the federal, state, and local level. The committee recommended a total appropriation of $2,910,027,627 with a county contribution of $1,839,071,460. They also made a recommendation on the technology modernization CIP project, which we will again discuss separately like we did with the college. Since that recommendation on April 29th, we received additional information from MCPS that Dr. McKnight has touched on about current year savings to help fund the gap in next year's fiscal year 23 budget. And that's the, the difference between the Board of Education's request and the county executive's recommendation. I will talk about the fund balance now further. As I mentioned, the committee's recommended total appropriation and how that will change with the fund balance conversation. So originally the committee recommended a reappropriation of $25 million in fund balance for fiscal year 23 to accurately reflect MCPS's monthly financial report for April 2022, which showed how much they have available for fiscal year 23, as well as the start of year, end, or start of year balance. MCPS's May 2022 monthly financial report, which came out this week, uh, reflected updated information on available fund balance and shows that they currently have $32 million available and a slight increase in the start of year balance for fiscal year 23. MCPS is requesting the authority to reappropriate a total of $35 million in their fund balance. 
This would be an additional $10 million for the total appropriation. And so you'll note that the $2,910,000,000 uh, $2 total appropriation amount would go up to $2,920,000,000. MCPS notes that they have made these additional savings for a fund balance through utilizing a heightened review of plan spending for the remainder of the year and increasing or bringing up their cutoff date for spending for fiscal year 22 for fiscal year 23. So council staff recommends that reappropriation of $35 million in fund balance, increasing that total appropriation. The county contribution would remain the same. That would reflect a $139 million increase over the approved fiscal year 22 budget for the total appropriation and an $86 million increase in county contribution. Mr. President, if, if we could stop at this moment, because I think that's not controversial in terms of that, and we have not had a chance to vote on that as a committee, so I'd like to just present that before uh, the full council in terms of the acceptance of the utilization of the fund balance amount of $35 million instead of the 25 that was approved by committee, and would like to move that. Second. Moved by Councilmember Ray, seconded by Councilmember Friedson. Uh, any discussion? No discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hands. That is unanimous. Thank you, Ms. McGuire. I, I mean, sorry, Ms. Rodriguez Hernandez, back to you. That's all right. I'll quickly go over what the committee discussed. Um, for local contributions and maintenance effort, the largest difference this year is that um, with the start of the official 10 year funding period for the Blueprint for Maryland's future, um, counties are now required to fund the greater of maintenance of effort or the Blueprint local share of the wealth equalized formulas. Um, so for MCPS and for the county, we're seeing MOE will be, or maintenance of effort will be the greater of the Blueprint share um, for the next few fiscal years. And so the recommended county contribution of that $1.839 billion represents 63% um, of the total MCPS budget and significantly higher than uh, the required MOE requirement as well as the blueprint local share. Uh, there have also been revisions to the maintenance of effort calculation. And um, as I mentioned, you know, our recommended, the count, committee's recommended county contribution is higher than MOE would be for this year. Uh, but that has been to address the COVID-19 pandemic impacts on enrollment for the past few years. And while MSDE, our Maryland State Department of Education, hasn't confirmed what the MOE calculation for fiscal year 24 is, we do know that increased in county contribution um, with increased enrollment would affect the per pupil funding and then the total funding level for maintenance of effort. So that's something we're keeping in mind too for the upcoming fiscal year 24. Uh, with state aid and blueprint, we have a recommended state aid amount of $863 million, which is a $41.5 million increase over fiscal year 22. And the governor also in the General Assembly passed $38.8 million in blueprint funding for the first official year. And you'll see um, the table reflects the, the categories of blueprint and how much funding they received and state aid. For programmatic adjustments, we have a large table um, that summarizes these changes from the Board of Education's budget. Um, and you'll see in categories of compensation and benefits, key positions, key investments such as most poverty impacted schools and well-being, digital learning, pre-K, as well as state related expenditures. And we highlight the revenue sources as well to note what we've received um, in state, federal, fund balance reappropriation, of course noting that $10 million increase now, uh, as well as the county contribution and showing how the increases in each of those categories, as well as the available start of year balance for fiscal year 23, can fund a lot of the priorities the Board of Education um, has requested. It will fund versions of it and uh, meet those priorities while maintaining fiscal sustainability for the future as we look at the Esther Cliffs coming up that Dr. Midnight highlighted, um, as well as per people funding with the hopeful increase of enrollment as we go throughout the years uh, after the COVID-19 pandemic. So that is the recommendation for the operating budget, is that $2,920,000,000. Um, and I will stop there with a county contribution of 80, of $101 billion, sorry, I apologize, $1,839,000,000 uh, for the operating budget. And then we'll discuss the capital budget after. Thank you. So, Mr. President, I turn over to you, unanimous committee recommendation, uh, and so we can go into discussion on the operating budget. Thank you very much. Uh, just a point of privilege here. Welcome, uh, Superintendent McKnight. Thank you so much for your leadership. Welcome, President Wolf. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, 
I was talking about this the other day at the same meeting that I attended with Councilmember Rice virtually in the East County, and somebody explained what the council's role is in the operating budget for MCPS. And the way I described it, uh, and this is at not 30,000, probably 100,000 feet, is our job is to make sure that the staff, the faculty, the administration have all the support, all the resources that they need to do their job and to do it effectively. And our job is to make sure that the students that sit in those seats have housing stability, uh, know where their next meal is going to come from, and have the support emotionally and logistically that they need to be put in the best possible position to succeed. That is an oversimplification, of course, but this budget reflects the immense importance and weight of the moment that we are in right now. And I think all of us share the concerns that Councilmember Reamer has raised. We're all experiencing it ourselves. We've all gotten the distress calls from faculty, staff, support staff, parents, students themselves with where we are with current conditions. And so it is more than appropriate that you have come forward with a very significant ask, but one that reflects the sobering reality of what is on the ground right now. And I tremendously appreciate the executive branch's effort to get as close to the full request uh, in a way that in some ways is unprecedented. Um, and I really ref uh, appreciate and respect the committee's efforts to try and see what more we can do. Um, and we have also been looking at the budget overall through that lens, ensuring that the students who are in those seats have the support that they need to be successful. And as chair of the HHS committee, we've been very much focused on the social and emotional well-being of these students, particularly as it relates to the mental health crisis before us. So um, it is a very large budget, uh, as it needs to be. And I know that many of our residents often uh, want to know exactly how the sausage is made. Um, and I have a great deal of respect and have grown to admire these last four years in this office, the various checks and balances, the various opportunities for input all the way through beyond just the budget year. And I know for a fact that there are data points and information that you all receive throughout the course of the year that are reflected in this budget, maybe not formally through the budget process, um, but organically. And I think this budget is evidence of that. So. Um, I don't see any questions or comments from colleagues with regards to the budget. Oh, we do? Okay, go ahead. Councilmember Hucker, that's right. I need a second cup of coffee this morning. Sorry, no, no. I, uh, my bad earlier. I need, need a third. A um, uh, couple quick questions. Uh, just to help us answer probably a lot of the same uh, mail that we're getting from, from parents and teachers and others. Um, we, we've talked quite a bit about the commitment um, of using ESSER funds to hire more mental health staff um, to uh, address this crisis we've been experiencing for, for years. And I'm really grateful for uh, the movement forward. And how, how many of those positions now have been filled? Like, I think last time I asked it was 28 out of 50. Is it higher? Yes. Now? And the number goes up weekly, 33. Terrific. So we now have 30. I mean, we are continuing to hire and, and move forward on that path. Um, some of them are in the queue to complete all of the requirements for finalization of hiring, but at this point we have extended the offer to 33. That's Thank you terrific. For Great. I mean, I, I'm, I'm one that thinks we should have done this a long time ago. I'm really grateful for the progress under your leadership, and um, we're, we're obviously not, we haven't solved the problem yet. Our students are still under such tremendous stress. They've experienced so much loss. We're still seeing overdoses and suicides and other things that we need to put an end to and do everything possible to, to address. Um, have you um, also considered using ESSER funds to cover the, uh, I think there's about 10,000 students that are at risk of losing their uh, free meal access when the federal support dries up in the future? How are you looking at that? Challenge. Thank you. I'm going to ask Ms. Dawson to speak about that sure. one specifically. We, we have been looking at that and just thinking specifically about um, how going through the this past few years and having that federal waiver, we actually don't want students to return back to a system before that had them concerned right. about, you know, meals overall. So we've been having discussions. But Dr. Dawson, I'll let you address that. Thank you. Yes, so um, we have put ESSER funding aside in terms of um, the ability to, to cover 
things like that. So for example, for summer school, um, our students will not have to worry about summer school. We have included that through ESSER funding. As we come back in the fall, uh, the waivers do end uh, mm -hmm. June 30th. And we also are working with our educational foundation to um, certainly cover all free um, and reduce price meals for students. Uh, and that is the, the beginning of our work to ensure that our students don't have to worry about those things. Right. On Tuesday, we just passed our, our meal debt policy. So that really is working with schools um, to ensure that our students come and everyone gets a meal. So um, this is an ongoing project for us uh, because we are committed to feeding our students. Thanks. I, I know we all agree on the equity emphasis and we know our kids aren't going to learn and perform well if they're hungry. Um, what you mentioned the qualification for free and reduced meals. Are you relying entirely on completed applications or are you looking at other determinants like census tract or um, the care for kids program or, or other other metrics you could use? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. So um, one of the other things that we did is we recently are involved in a pilot with um, the Maryland State, State Department of Education and mm -hmm. Uh, that allows us to have direct certification through Medicaid. So there's there are direct certifications that um, help so that uh, students don't have to fill out any applications, and that will be another way to increase um, the ability and Great. access for Great. our students. Great. Um, I remember one uh, follow-up I had uh, about the, um, the the mental health staff. I, I, I had heard some feedback that so many of the new uh, staff were being used to refer students out to services rather than treating them themselves. Is that um, is that really happening? And is that um, what's the, what's the sort of uh, the rationale behind a strategy like that? Rather than using MSWs, you're hiring to perform the services rather than refer out. Ms. Rubin, I'll let you address that question. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. So actually, that is not happening. What's what's happening is that we have a complement of. Um, mental health providers, right? We have our PPWs, some of whom are licensed clinicians, as some of our counselors mm -hmm. are. Our newly hired social workers are performing, uh, they have a caseload, and they are providing direct services to those students. However, in our partnership, which is extremely strong with HHS, mm -hmm. and is, as you've mentioned, and I, I think Council Member Reamer as well, we are finding that some of the services are, or the needs of the students are so significant sure. that they do require for us to work with our partners to get those intensive services. Right. But outside of that, there are direct services being provided by those clinicians. Certainly, yeah, there's appropriate need for a referral um, for certain cases, I'm sure. But you, you, what you're saying is it's only being done when necessary and you're taking advantage of all the training and qualifications and certifications of our new staff. Precisely. Okay. And it's, it's excellent because as we are able to rotate students out of those caseloads, they're able to serve a variety of students, which is something that we heard uh, significantly from our community members, our staff members that was needed. Thanks. Okay, great. And. Um, Third, I wanted to just ask about, I know we're all getting feedback about the loss of teachers, which has been happening for quite a while, but we heard a new number that we're, um, we're going to be losing eight, almost 800 teachers. Um, what are your latest thoughts on how that's, why that's happening, what the drivers are, and um, what we should be, how it compares to previous years and what we should be doing to mitigate that? Thank you. We've been having this discussion. I'm going to ask someone to swap out with Dr. Nixon um, because I want her to bring forth the specific data that we've been looking at. What we found generally is what's happening in Montgomery County Public Schools is nothing different happening on par with school districts across the nation. Mm -hmm. And we've looked at school districts that are comparable in size and demographics to us. Um, now, we're also looking at a comparison of what the last two years. The last two years as a result of COVID-19, everyone in the world is rethinking you know, what would they want life to be like? Um, I will say that I am so confident and excited about the work that we've been doing to prepare for this pandemic or not. Like for instance, I'm really thinking about how do we make MCPS a destination place of employment and that mm -hmm. feeds into pathway work that we have done so that when we hire and onboard new staff, they come into a position that they're interested in, but they also see the opportunity to grow into other positions needed into Montgomery County. 
focusing on our academies and our high schools and thinking about, you know, how do we bring those students back, whether it may be CTE work um, that we need in, in many of our positions in Montgomery mm -hmm. County or into some of the professional streams of, of pathways of work in Montgomery County and engaging them early in the process of that and monitoring diligently um, across the state and the nation to make sure that we are leading in many ways uh, that make us a, a very competitive district. And I say that today coming off of the heels of a tentative agreement uh, that we announced yesterday in which all of our employees received a 3.35% increase in pay um, in their wages. And we're excited about that. Now the blueprint required that we do that for teachers over the five years, but we've been able to make a significant you know, uh, progress in that area. And we know that that's what's needed given inflation, given the types of work that we're asking people to do, given the fact that we're asking them to be innovative, all of those pieces. So I just wanted to share that generally mm -hmm. because I think it is about um, us always branding and thinking of what we can do to make MCPS a destination employee ahead of uh, some of the things that we've experienced as a result of COVID-19. But I know I said a lot, I'll turn it over to Dr. Nixon if I missed anything. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Helen Nixon. I'm the Chief of Human Resources and Development. I think Dr. McKnight did a fine job kind of setting the context for some of the incentives that we've had in place. Uh, last December, uh, we offered an $1,100 incentive to all staff. Um, our team in labor relations has been successfully negotiating with our association partners. Moreover, in the Department of Certification and Staffing, we have two fully dedicated recruiters who have been hosting job fairs in person and who have been traveling um, up and down the East Coast and parts in the Midwest looking for great talent to bring to MCPS. A word about some of the separations that, that were mentioned in terms of our teachers. We do provide our employees an opportunity for an exit interview. Some of the data that we've collected, both anecdotally and you know, quantitatively and qualitatively, has been we've heard from teachers that um, they are either looking for relocation. Um, we have heard that there are um, some teachers who have found that they've got to return home to care for aging parents. Mm -hmm. They've made reassessments of things that have happened during their lives in COVID. So there are any number of reasons um, above as well um, eligible for retirement, certainly and personal reasons. And so with that, we know that we have roughly um, 579 current vacancies. That's full and part-time. We've hired almost 300 teachers. It's a very fluid number. Our, our, our staff offer contracts on an almost daily basis. We've had an opportunity to uh, partner with uh, university partnerships. We have a number of open contracts, and those open contracts will be filled soon um, in terms of the vacancies that we have. We also have opportunities as our projected enrollments in various schools are um, climbing and or declining. Those staff members are repurposed to other schools to help fill vacancies as well. Um, we are excited about the work of the Maryland Blueprint and the investment in getting our teachers nationally board certified and the ways in which the Blueprint has committed to increase salaries for our teachers. We have invested in work to make sure that our support services professional staff have an opportunity to build careers in MCPS as well. We have spent quite, quite a bit of time this year mapping out new opportunities and trajectories for our SEIU Pathways programs. Um, one of the things that we are very committed to is finding opportunities to ensure that our support professional staff see opportunities for economic mobility. And we, um, with our administrators, certainly we uh, appreciate the very hard work that our principals and our assistant principals um, invest in. And this year we were able to look at our elementary school principal pay scale and um, adjust our elementary school principals to the middle school principal pay rate. That was something that was recent, recently done as well. So we are trying to find a variety of ways, not only for the economic incentives, but ways that we are helping our employees build their careers in MCPS um, and working with um, our union partners across the board to make sure that we are in constant communication with them. They are our partners and our messengers as well. Very full answer. Thank you. Good. I'm, I'm very, uh, yeah, it's been my understanding that we used to perform better in our employee surveys, right, um, than we, we do currently. And I very much appreciate what you said about, you know, we're, there's, there's a national uh, a 
challenge with teachers leaving positions, but also a great resignation and all kinds of. Um, I appreciate what you said, Dr. McKnight, about CTE uh, um, uh, pipeline as well, because we you don't need just teachers. We That's need right. paras. We need social workers. We need uh, security guards. We need, you need HVAC technicians. My understanding, you need pretty much everybody. Um, and there's lots of demanding new um, uh, 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 requirements under blueprint as well that we're going to have to reach as well. So I know there's a, a lot of moving parts and I'm glad to hear you're on top of this. You mentioned the quantitative analysis you're doing on the exit interviews. If you'd be able to share that with us in the future, I'd be really interested in hearing what people are, sure. you know, are, how they're responding um, as, the, as they're leaving, uh, what the feedback we're getting is. Um, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Council Vice President Glass followed by Council Member Juwondo. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, everybody. Uh, President Wolf, it's good to see you here in the chamber. Uh, officially welcome. Uh, and uh, Superintendent McKnight, it's nice to say that. Welcome. And, and to everybody else on your team, thank you for, for the presentation and, and the discussion because uh, it, quite frankly, has been a rough two years. We know this uh, across all aspects of life and our society. Uh, but even before the pandemic, there were societal concerns that manifest themselves in the classroom and in our schools. Clearly, when a child enters the classroom hungry, facing economic insecurity, worried about their housing situation, it doesn't matter how good that teacher is, how modern that classroom is, that child is going to struggle. And the pandemic has exacerbated that. And as we look at the MCPS budget and we talk about this entire 6.3 three billion dollar budget that the council is taking up we look at that holistic approach how to help the whole child and help our community help their parents help our neighbors um, and i appreciate the thoughtfulness in which all of these conversations are being had um, with regard to you know one particular aspect that i mentioned the food insecurity i do want to say that i appreciate the change of course with the food policy for free and reduced meals that was recently announced. I think that when we recognize that so many kids have their only warm meal at school to penalize those who would not otherwise be able to pay for it or who end up in arrears um, is not the right thing to do. So I appreciate the course correction that I've recently read about. It is the right thing to do and we need to continue making sure that kids are fed and those that only have that opportunity for a good warm meal in school continue to receive that opportunity um, but you know ultimately everything that we're talking about here in the budget is balancing those needs balancing the needs that you all face the growing needs plus all other aspects of county life um, and just you know one question i have is about how mcps balances the needs and in going through the packet i see the uh the new organizational chart that is in there. Um, there are a lot of branches on that organizational chart. You know, it almost looks like a full-fledged tree within MCPS. Maybe it's the tree of knowledge, but it is the tree nonetheless. And so as we balance these needs and, and you try to allocate these funds, what is your determination for making increases towards central staff positions versus school staff positions versus any other positions, right? Because we want to make sure that the funding that we're providing is going to where it needs to go and towards the support staff that can best get us there. So Dr. McKnight, can you elaborate into some of that thought process? Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Glass. And so glad you raised that because it is a balancing act all the time. Um, the first priority is making sure that our schools have what they need. That's, that's just where it starts. We as a central office stand ready to support everything that happens within that classroom, within that school, because that is exactly where the student is. What I have found over my entire career in Montgomery County Public Schools and other districts, at the United States Department of Education working with many districts, is that you have to think about what are the unique challenges that exist within every school community, every uh, central community, every community, and say what's the infrastructure that is needed in order for those supports to be coordinated into the school in a very meaningful way. And as deputy superintendent, I had a lot of time to interact with our uh, employees, talk with our principals, our community members, and every single thing you see structurally in Central 
that is there in this reorganization chart in many ways have bubbled up to a need that has been expressed from our organization from the ground up. Um, and I'll call out a few key positions, like for instance, you know, I stand here as a former deputy superintendent. I did not replace myself and, uh, you know, I recognize how important that is. When we talk about all of the offices that have to coordinate the support that's needed in schools, that is a necessary position. We have new positions like, for instance, and I'll call out two that have really come about in education over the last couple of years, a medical officer. We've never had a medical officer in our school system. After COVID-19, you, you saw firsthand the collaboration that's needed with medical experts, whether it may be Department of Health and Human Services, Maryland Department of Health, and a host of others. And so we need someone within the school system to understand how we balance the interests of students and their learning and all those priorities with health needs. And so that's a whole nother part of an organization that has to be coordinated so that that support finds its way into the school. And when we hear our principals talk about the need for, you know, or the stress of contact tracing for a year that interfered with learning, that's a central position that is necessary and needed. And when you see the deputy superintendent coordinating positions such as that, um, medical officer with school and principal supervision, with curriculum and instruction, by the way, that has to be innovative to personalize education for the need of every single student whether they are in a magnet program or not. That has to be coordinated in a way so that it gets into the classroom to the teacher in a meaningful way who can then provide that to the student in a, in a meaningful way. And so I share that with you as just some components of why that coordination in our system is important. And then I also call out, uh, I, you know, two other positions that are in the organizational chart that are different for us, but. I hope our community sees celebration in hearing their voices reflected in this. Um, we have a senior community advisor. We have many interest groups within our county who've said over and over again, it's really hard to make that proactive connection with Montgomery County Public Schools. We wanna be a part, we want to help. We want our interest to be focused in what we see happening in the school system and we want it to be close to the superintendent. We have it. <laughs> You know, I am one person, but I also want to make myself very accessible to every single community member that lives within Montgomery County schools for the purpose of, that lives in Montgomery County for the purpose of why we said earlier, the school system is a very important component of that. And then we also have the special education liaison position. That is one that is there. So for all the reasons that we know, we have many vulnerable populations within our school system. But when we experience COVID-19, again, sometimes we have to step out of ourselves into the seats of others. And so for some of our most vulnerable students, in some cases who are unable to speak, who are unable to communicate, who are unable to um, be in the classroom in ways that we define in our minds as traditional ways, they experience a different experience during COVID-19 with not being in the classroom and we have to acknowledge that and that was nothing that any of us expected around the nation you see school systems places struggle trying to figure out how are we going to provide services to those students my heart goes out to those families i heard from them i saw them i saw a video of what exactly what that meant so we also have to be in tune to what needs repair and so while none of us expected that we experienced it together and so we've got to be able to build a bridge to work through how we rebuild some of those experiences as a result of COVID-19 with our families of students receiving special education services. And sometimes it's very good to have a liaison who understands that from a perspective of the family and working with the school system to bring resolution to those, those types of things. So I highlight that, uh, mm -hmm. Councilman Glass, because uh, I think it just gets at, I want the community and you to understand why the structure supports a need in Montgomery County. And uh, that explanation along with others that we can go into and when we have more time, I'm happy to engage. Sure, no, I, I appreciate you elaborating on that. Clearly the health officer position, uh, no doubt the importance of that and understand the engagement officer, right? Given the diverse community that we are, uh, that we are in and that we celebrate to use your own word. Um, you know, we're, these are new times, there are new needs, uh, but I also think that we need to think anew 
about our structures and the structures that have been here for decades that we continue building upon. And so as we move forward, uh, not knowing what any of the budgetary uh, situations might be, um, but knowing that this budget has been an extremely good one for uh, reasons that we all know, thank you federal government, thank you state government as well, um, I think we just need to sometimes take a look back and maybe refine um, or find more efficiencies so that we can use whatever resources moving forward uh, to put them where they are best needed. And, and in my opinion, that is in the classroom to make sure that our kids feel whole and that they are educated to the best that they can. So uh, thank you for this conversation and uh, good to see you again. Thank you. I've got uh, Councilmember Juwando followed by Chairman Rice and then Councilmember Friedson. Great. Good morning. Good to see you. Um, good to see you, President Wolf. Thanks for being here and the whole team. We were just remarking, you guys come, you come in heavy <laughs> because we've got a lot of students and families to help. And, and I'm, I'm to the last conversation, it's important. Um, and appreciate all the work of all your colleagues. A um, couple, couple questions. Uh, the I'm very proud of the work we did on the ENC committee to put your budget forward. I'm glad the action we just took to approve the additional use of the fund balance. So that's really, we're really happy about that. A um, couple of things that have come up that I wanted to raise. I'm also really happy about the senior coordinator um, that you just mentioned. I did not know about that, but uh, one of the things that I'm passionate about is connecting our seniors in our schools to be able to have that two-way comb combination. Interages has some programming over the years and others, so that's something I think we, need, we can expand. So really happy to hear that. Um, one of the things that's come up, and I've, I've asked this in other forums, but I want to raise it here, is the, uh, the change in pay if you have a, someone who's a paraeducator, for example, who does takes on an additional job, you know, outside of their normal job, they, st they step up to do something that's needed in the system, and they're paid a different rate for that different job, okay? Um, that's something that has come up with our, uh, particularly in our paraeducator context, the SEIU represented folks. I know as a parent, right, the paraeducators for my daughter who's, for all of my kids, but particularly my daughter who's uh, autistic, they're like a lifeline. I mean, they, they love them more than they love anybody at the school. And there's a value in that relationship and that expertise that comes with them, you know, uh, that they have in their normal job. And so I would just want to ask is, is that policy of not paying them at their normal rate for their, what they are normally doing and changing it based on the job position. Can you discuss that? Is that under consideration for changing? Uh, I obviously think it, you can see where I'm leading. I think it should yes. be, but I want to know that, you know, where that is. No, I appreciate that. And as I start, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Edwards to come up, who works with our lead negotiator, who can speak to all the specifics of that. But I will say um, we came into this this year really thinking about that, and I want to commend uh, SEIU as our partners who were bringing forward the fact that many of our paraeducators are serving in ways in the classroom um, that we needed to acknowledge differently. I actually went out and saw a couple of them um, who I'd heard about and you are absolutely right in terms of the way that you're describing the work and support that they they've done so uh, we made it a commitment to have that conversations within our negotiation space um, to acknowledge how we were going to provide additional funding for those paraeducators who you know extend beyond what we have asked them to do in the past so Ms. Edwards I'll let you speak to the specifics of that Good morning, everyone. Thank morning. you, Council Member Jawando, for the um, question this morning. Um, as Dr. McKnight shared earlier, we have worked with our association partners throughout the year. And one of the things that we've had preliminary conversations around, and we know with this year especially, our staff have gone above and beyond to really hold up our schools, make sure students are fine, staff um, work collaboratively together, and parents feel a sense of comfort when they send their children into us. So our preliminary conversations with SEIU have centered on some of the things that paraeducators do, not only the point in which you're discussing, but also for our paraeducators and more of our discrete special education programs, because that work looks different. And so we started those preliminary conversations. We're moving into um, collaboration committees where we can have more of an in-depth discussion, but we do recognize that 
depending on which school, which program you're in, that work is going to manifest itself differently. And it's a component of not only recognizing what occurs, but also the retention component. Absolutely. Um, because there's skills, there's a passion that people bring to the work. Um, we want them to stay. The families like the, the staff that are with them and the students as well. So um, that is a point where we've had preliminary discussions. We'll be going further in depth throughout the year to be able to build off going into the summer and hopefully into the coming year. Really happy to hear that. I know you can't discuss your discussions, <laughs> but uh, but glad that that is a topic of discussion and that it, you, you're recognizing that. And that's, I really appreciate that. Um, one other question here, the uh, use of contractors to provide services that have normally been provided by staff. Um, that's something that I know is there absolutely like, for example, in the mental health space, we need contract. There's a lot of reasons we need contractors, but can you talk about how you're balancing that analysis and, and looking at that going forward of weighting the contract issue versus uh, services that can be provided by full-time staff? Yes, absolutely. So we're using metrics like, for instance, what professions or what staff are we having difficulty hiring, whether it may be whether we have the staff that meets the need for our qualifying certification. Um, that could sometimes be a challenge, and it may be best to contract out if that's the situation. Um, and looking at just trends, what, what professions are we, while we have our pathways and other ways that we're building up right. at the same time, looking at what the need is right now and if we're struggling to be able to staff specific positions, then we are starting to look at, you know, how can we contract out work? Um, and in some ways, you know, we think about fiscally in the system why it's important to look at both because when you, you think about what staff you want to have onboarded and who will be in the system that you bring on long term, you also want to think about what are services that may not require that. That, that just pan out to better contract. So it's it's work that we evaluate all the time okay. based on some of that criteria. Yeah, and I think that makes sense, an ongoing, you know, ongoing capacity of looking at that. Um, last thing I'll say on the pipeline issue, uh, I want to work with you, and I know we'll do this on the ENC committee and the full council, on helping create more stronger, robust, and larger pathways for students, MCPS students, to enter MCPS. And uh, I know you all want that same thing and you can speak some say briefly right now but i just think that's a all these issues we're talking about the retention growing our growing our own our economy in the future that i think there's real promise there and i know you i i, I know you agree that work has already started councilman juando i look forward to you as joining us um in partnership with that work and everything that we need within the school system it's all sitting in our classrooms right now at this moment it's our job to create the pathway and identify any barriers and remove them. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Juando. Uh, Councilmember Rice is going to play cleanup. Uh, uh, and so we're going to go to Councilmember Friedson, followed by Councilmember Katz. I was somehow booted and moved ahead at the same time, and I'm not really sure how that works, but I'm just a Montgomery County Public School graduate, so I'm still working on learning here. But uh, first of all, thanks uh, to everybody. It's obviously been an extraordinary time for everybody, for anybody who works in a school, for anybody who has children, for anybody who has had to make decisions for other people. Uh, this has just been an exceptionally difficult time of impossible choices, uh, of keeping people safe and continuing uh, to keep people healthy uh, at the same time. And sometimes those two issues compete with each other in a way that they perhaps never had before, at least we never realized uh, that they uh, did before. Um, I'm excited to approve this. It's very important, obviously. Uh, but we talked a lot today about um, funding for the school system, and you talked, uh, Superintendent McKnight, about the ESSER funding. And uh, we've talked a little bit about all of the support that has allowed for certain things to happen. And it just strikes me at this time of incredible challenge you know, where mental health issues in our schools and among our kids and among our staff and, and teachers, uh, where achievement gaps uh, and learning loss and uh, all of the various issues, notwithstanding health disparities and food insecurity and all the other things that don't stop at the school door, you know, a kid who doesn't have enough food to eat or who comes from a family that doesn't know where their next meal is coming from 
their hunger doesn't go away because they're sitting in a classroom. And the issues that happen after school and before school don't change uh, and stop, uh, you know, just because they're sitting in a comfortable and healthy uh, classroom. But we also have this incredible opportunity, this transformational opportunity with historic levels of federal support and funding to change the way that we've been doing things. Because a lot of the ways that we've been doing things have been working pretty well. And a lot of the things that we've been doing haven't been working nearly as well as we would want them to and are failing certain kids and are failing certain families and are failing uh, in uh, particular communities. And, uh, you know, I just hope that we don't miss this opportunity because I think if we miss this opportunity now, not only are those challenges going to get worse, which weren't new from the pandemic, the only thing new in the pandemic was COVID-19 itself. Everything else, it just took those existing cracks and it just blew them wide open or shined a bright light into the, the hole that existed there. And so now we're confronting them, which I think is important and is certainly the first step. But I just hope that five years from now, seven years from now, 10 years from now, we don't look back and say, you know, if only we had done things a little bit differently, if only if we had taken the, you know, the, the, this opportunity. I, this is true in county government, by the way, but I also think it's particularly true in the school system. Like now is the time to change things. Now is the time to do things differently. Now is the time to take some of the money that we have and try a program that we never thought we'd be able to attempt to do. Let's do that. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been talking a lot recently about a conversation I had with a very successful business person a long time ago, and I asked him about his, how he runs the business. And he told me that he looks at two things, success rate and failure rate. And I said, well, what do you focus on more? He said, failure rate. And I said, oh, if it gets too high. He said, no, if it gets too low. He said, the rest of the team is focused on succeeding at the things that we're doing. My job is to make sure that we're still innovating, that we have a culture of change, that we're, we're, we're moving the needle. So if the, if the failure rate gets too low, too close to zero, that's when I step in. And that's when I push the team to try harder and do things more differently. And the, the biggest concern that I have with a place like Montgomery County and a place like Montgomery County Public Schools, places that have been historically successful, is that we get comfortable. And what we start defining as success is not really good enough for our families and for our kids. And we just do it because it's the thing we've always been doing. And so I think, you know, we have been forced to not be comfortable during the pandemic. And that is a bad thing for a lot of reasons, but it's also a tremendous opportunity for a lot of reasons too. And so uh, it's less a question than a plea. Uh, I know you're, you're focused on this. Uh, I don't wanna lose it. And I hope that you take this opportunity, you're new in this role, uh, you know, you're, you have the opportunity to shape the school system in the way that you want, in the way that you imagine, in the way that you know that uh, is needed. And I just hope you seize that opportunity. And I know you'll have a lot of support from us. And I think we have to be willing to try new programs that might not work. We have to be willing to change policies that aren't working to something else that may not work. And we have to be willing to adapt and tweak things as we go. And if ever there was an opportunity to do it with historic levels of funding coming out of a pandemic where none of us know where things are uh, totally heading, now is the time to do that. So I just wanted to share that. It's not a budget question, but it has everything to do with how we spend the budget dollars. And I wish you well and look forward to working together with you to seize this transformational opportunity we have before us. Our kids, our families, our county, we're all dependent on you. So thanks. Thank you so much. Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much. It's my thought that the reason Councilmember Rice wanted to wait is because he wanted to hear what I have to say is what I mean. Am, am I wrong? Yeah. Um, but not me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, I hadn't even remembered that. I, it, how shocking. Um, um, Dr. McKnight, once again, congratulations and thank you for doing what you're doing. I, when I was uh, in the in the um, in your building, uh, I guess a couple months ago already, uh, several weeks ago, I looked at the wall of all the superintendents that were there, and, and candidly, I knew half of them at, at one point or another. I mean, uh, their, some of their, their children went to high school with me, graduated high school with me, and uh, Dr. Elserode's son, David, was a was, uh, graduate with me. 
But, you know, over the years, Montgomery County has changed so dramatically. Uh, my mother, I've told this story a zillion times, but my mother was 30 years older than I am. And, and uh, she went to Gaithersburg uh, School when it was all 12 grades were where Gaithersburg Elementary is today. And when she went there, there were temporaries. It was wooden buildings there. And uh, I went 30 years later, and some of those temporary buildings were still there. They called them, we've called them relocatables. We've called them different names. Over the, but some of their problems have never gone away. And some of it is because things grew. We, we had people that wanted, and we we're very proud of the fact that they wanted to come to Montgomery County because of our school system, and they still do. And we hear, yeah, just like you do, that, you know, that, that things could be better. Sure they could, and we want them to be better. And the way we want them to be better is doing exactly what we're doing today, making certain, as has been repeated time and time again, that the resources are there. As is no secret, my wife uh, worked for Montgomery County Public Schools for 40 years. She was a speech and language pathologist for 20. She was a pupil personnel worker for 20. And I used to hear every morning at breakfast exactly what you were talking, not everything that you were talking about today, but a lot of the concerns and the needs and the, and, and the, 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 the heart that is shown inside a school. She would go into people's homes. I mean, I know you still do to make certain that people are safe and to figure out what's the best course for that, literally, for that child to take. My my daughter works as a secretary at Churchill High School as well. So I, we, we hear some in a continual basis. But I, I think that of all the things that we do in, in the county on the, with the county budget, and everything we do is important. I'm not going to take away from anything we do. But of all the things that we do, I think the fact that the school system is involved is probably the most important because it affects every other uh, topic. Just yesterday, uh, uh, I believe he was sitting in the same chair you are, uh, Dr. McKnight, but, but the police chief was here. And one of the suggestions that uh, Vice President Glass had come up with was, and, and we all have agreed to, to try to figure out how we can do this, is to enhance the cadet program for the police. And of course, everybody said, well, you know, we're working with Montgomery College. And then we said, we're going to work also with their partner, Montgomery County Public Schools, to figure out how that young person who might be considering law enforcement or fire, you know, being a first responder or whatever, that that young person would have the opportunity to know whether they liked it or they didn't very early on in their life. And, and at a one point in Montgomery County, we had a lot of legacy people. We had people whose grandfather or grandmother, in many cases, would have worked as a, as a first responder. And, and now they're saying to that same grandchild, you know, I don't know that you really want to do this. There's, there's other opportunities. They, you know, you're, you're not as respected. There's, there's, uh, you can make more money doing X and Y. But that child has to have the opportunity to know whether or not they really want it. So we, we turn to you once again, and this is, we did it for nurses, we're doing it for, for so many different, different occupations. We turn to you once again to say, you got to help us out because we need people to be doing this type of work. So I, I'm, I'm similar to, to, uh, to uh, Council Member Friedson. I don't have a question. I just have a thank you. And I know that you and, and all the educators who work never get enough of those. Thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for saving our children. And thank you for working with each of us and the entire community to get us to that better spot. And with that, I turn back to you, Mr. Council President. Thank you. Um, I do have a couple thoughts, questions uh, before turning it over to Councilmember Rice uh, to, to um, wrap us up. But so obviously, and I appreciate Councilmember Hucker's questions regarding uh, retention, which is a crisis. Uh, and, and although we are not alone, uh, we are uniquely positioned to be able to address that here in ways some other jurisdictions are not. So one of the things we talked about when I had the opportunity to meet with you and the association leaders was what other things we can do beyond salary, direct salary and compensation, beyond direct policies, beyond direct support that MCPS can provide to the faculty, staff, and support staff and administrators 
Um, and one of the ideas we discussed was looking at, for example, the homeowner's tax credit, which has been extended to first responders um, to address the crises across the state and recruitment and retention in that space. That's a good example of a collaborative effort that we can take in partnership with the Board of Education as well as the administration in partnership with our associations. Are there other potential opportunities that may be out there beyond just directly within the context of the budget that could serve as a blueprint, things we can creatively think about in tackling this from different angles? Yes, absolutely. And thank you so much. Uh, this is this is an opportunity for us to dream. I mean, this is what we're doing. We're dreaming and we're dreaming up a, a better future in Montgomery County public schools. And that example that you shared with us was an amazing one. As we recruit uh, teachers coming into the profession in Montgomery County, we actually want them to live here. Um, and that means there has to be affordable housing um, in ways that we can encourage that. That's what's going to make us stand out as they consider all the places they can go in this entire nation and choose Montgomery County. So I, I like that example. A, a few other um, pieces that we've been looking at, and a part of it is stemming from the blueprint, is looking at the career ladder. So when we think about the teaching profession, um, one, I think the first thing that we can all do is start from a space of respecting that profession as a whole, as a community. I mean, and again, I, I call upon everybody in our community just to reflect on that, and especially since all of our community members, if you had children, became teachers, <laughs> whether you wanted to or not for a period of time in the pandemic, because you were, you know, many of our families were there helping our children, they got a chance to see up front. Um, and, and when I say respecting the profession, um, and this has been an ongoing conversation when I was a fellow at the Department of Education, there was a whole initiative around respect for the profession that was based in this premise because nationally we saw, and it's no different from our teachers here in Montgomery County, what do we need to feel respected as a profession? So yes, affordable housing is one. We don't want to pay you a salary that doesn't allow you to be able to live well. Secondly, what are the things that you can do that continues to make you feel like your profession is being elevated? And for many of our teachers, they need to have the opportunity to professionally grow and learn and still remain to be teachers if that's what they decide to do. So that's where our career ladder comes into play, which is in the blueprint. So how can we expand opportunities for them to um, learn? And here's an idea that, 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 that we've been uh, talking about. So in the system, we provide professional learning for our teachers in the areas in which they is their area of expertise. But we also know that it's important for them to prepare students for the workforce, the career area, whatever it is that they desire to do. How magnificent is it for those uh, folks in those professions to actually come and provide some direct professional development to our teachers? Not only is that benefiting the student, but it's benefiting the teacher in a way that it opens them up to a whole nother opportunity that, that can align with making their teaching better, but also allowing them to build partnerships and learn about the professions in a different way um, that may provide that professional desire that they're looking for that doesn't have them feel, make them feel motivated to have to move on to the next thing and not remain in the classroom. So that's one example. Um, I'll say that our uh, MCA partners and others are, are going to be best at us sitting down together as you initiated with us really having a conversation and taking into account what our teachers are saying about the best way to continue to reinforce them being a very respected profession. Um, and some of that is, you know, again, as you said, budget, but some of it's not. Some of it's just the experience that they have. And um, our pathways work, which we talked about earlier, is another part of that as well. Um, how can they continue to grow and do that work that influences the teaching that happens in the classroom and um, have it, have them experience something else for a little bit of time to help them build skill and then return back to the classroom? So those are some, some examples of what we've been thinking about, but I look forward to us continuing to sit and have that conversation with our teachers and with our offices of human resources and others to build that together. I appreciate that. That's really helpful. And I, as we discussed, I think post-budget, as the dust settles a little bit, there'll be an opportunity for us to look um, strategically and collaboratively to see what other options may be out there to address that very important issue. Um, last couple points are I really appreciated, Dr. McKnight, that you have carried forward the legacy of recognizing the importance of partnerships. Uh, and that MCPS alone cannot provide all the support as much as it tries to the children, youth, and families that you serve. 
And a lot of that partnership is predicated on sharing data and analysis so that we can have a better path forward and a better understanding of where the needs are in respective communities and within schools. Um, and I know uh, that can be challenging uh, because obviously uh, there's confidentiality that we will never breach. Um, but could you talk a little bit about some of that information sharing um, moving forward so that we can address this crisis before us because so many different organizations are doing their best to provide wraparound support for these children and youth. Mm -hmm. And we all can't do it alone. Absolutely. We've made some steps in the right direction to improve that. And the first example I'll share is our collaboration with the Montgomery County Police Department this year as we were trying to solve the problems of how have we allowed, you know, different uh, disparities to exist in discipline and arrest and all those pieces from students, then how did our collection of data process not uh, work as a nice marriage so that we could see what's happening in Montgomery County Public Schools and how that marries up with data that's being collected at the police department. So the first step um, that we made there that was very successful is looking at those data sets and recognizing and identifying what we all had a shared concern in and how we were going to form the data platform to allow, allow us to share information that was comparable and tell us what we needed to look at. And I think with every agency that we partner with, that actually has to be the starting point. So we, we all should and will be accountable for everything that we put into place, uh, put in place for our students and for our school system. And that means we have to have measures that we look at that tells us whether we are progressing in, in ways that we want to or not. And so as we build those partnerships, it's first asking the question, what data will we look at that shows uh, our improvement or not? And what, what, should, what are the data components that need to exist in this platform that will allow us to ensure upfront that we're going to be measuring the right things that tell us the story of what we're looking at? So again, I use the Montgomery County Police Department as the best example in terms of uh, another agency that we had to work with closely as a school system to do that. I look forward to us continuing to do the same with all of the other agencies that we partner with. Because the reason we're able to answer the question that Councilman Friedson brought forward is, you know, how are we making sure this opportunity does not miss us? Well, that means the entire time we're being accountable and looking at, are we making progress or not? And if we are, are we making enough? If not, what more, what more do we need to do? What do we need to change? What do we need to continue doing? Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, just the last couple of thoughts or comments, but I know, um, Parent engagement uh, is, is always is so important and can be a challenge, particularly in schools where parents are so, uh, have a hard time uh, finding free time uh, because of, you know, job commitments and such. So I know that has been an emphasis of yours, one that will need to be moving forward, um, particularly as we are experiencing new waves of migrants that are coming forward um, that need support and need our love, need our attention. Um, and I appreciate your leadership in that regard. And finally, just, um, you know, we, we have these broad conversations within the context of the budget. The committee does a fantastic job addressing issues in a myriad of different ways. But um, I do look forward to continuing the collaboration and partnership as we address various aspects of challenges that go beyond just one organization's ability to be able to address them. Uh, it, it, we can't stovepipe. Uh, and, and I know we all know that. Um, and Councilwoman Navarro recently reminded us and gave us a really helpful background on the history of the Kennedy Cluster Project, uh, which is among the better examples in the last 14 years of a true collaboration to look at system building and changes um, from a variety of different angles. So as long as I'm around, I look forward to carrying that legacy forward as well, and I appreciate your leadership. Uh, I will now turn it over to Councilmember Rice to take us home. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the very robust discussion today around a myriad of issues that are incredibly important to the success of the school system and, more importantly, the success of our children, uh, which is a direct reflection of the success of our community. Uh, as you said, Dr. McKnight, it is really important to remember uh, that our schools are microcosms of our greater community, uh, and if we are to, uh, and I want to take uh, Councilmember Katz, because it's very interesting um, in his statement about how important education is. Um, I've always said, since I first ran for office back in 2006, education is the most important function of government. And anyone who says anything otherwise, I will be able to list 
for you how everything is tied to education. Um, I've continued to espouse that and believe that still to this day. I will say that um, one of the things that I think is incredibly important to remind us is that we are in the first year of the blueprint implementation. And that blueprint implementation is something where we were fortunate in the state of Maryland to be ahead of the curve when it came to COVID-19. Um, because we were already laying at that point a foundation for how we were going to revamp education in this state to more appropriately respond to many of the issues that my colleagues have raised. Everything from addressing the opportunity gap to teacher retention, to making sure that our community is more engaged and involved in our schools, to making sure that we have early interventions when it comes to our kids. All of those issues are addressed in the blueprint. And so I wanna encourage folks, I know it's easy that once this is done for people to forget about what's in it, but we've spent three years, 24 members volunteered their time, including myself, to try and create what would be a better system for this state moving forward and a model for what I believe the nation can use for creating an even better educational system across this country. And so it is one where you look at the infusion and uh, reinforcement of community schools, uh, making sure that we have mentorship, making sure that we have expanded programs, not only in the summer, but after school, some of the things we do well, but certainly things that we're looking to build on making sure that with community schools, wellness centers, uh, and those kinds of aspects that Council Member Navarro has championed this year as a part of the budget. All of those things are encompassed in the blueprint. Even when it comes to uh, accoutrements for teachers, not just the career ladders, but also talking about the fact of tax credits and other kinds of things are listed in the blueprint. So I encourage folks, please, hold us accountable as the Government and Accountability Commission, uh, to which former County Executive Ike Leggett is a part of, uh, to be able to ensure that we do these things that we know will create a better system for our kids. While yes, we have learned lessons for COVID, the reality is, is that we learned those lessons long before COVID. And to your point, Dr. McKnight, we already knew these were an issue. What we heard from Council Member Navarro We've been working on this for a long time. This ain't nothing new. And so from that standpoint, if we commit ourselves to that change, we will commit ourselves to answering the call of what needs to be there. And I'll close with this, because it's not just us. It is our federal government who has left us woefully short when it comes to uh, this June deadline. Uh, certainly we may be able to use slur funds or gear funds uh, hopefully the government steps up and the governor can allocate funds across this state uh, to help our school systems when it comes to alleviating uh, what's going to happen if the federal government does not act in terms of ensuring that we continue to have free meals for all of our children. It is something that national partners like No Kid Hungry and Feeding America and others are working on diligently every single day. I know I have meetings with them in my capacity as chair of the National Association of Counties uh, Human Services and Education Committee. We talk about it daily, um, but I will say this. Uh, it is also incredibly important for us to make sure uh, that we uh, locally are utilizing our uh, aspects of women who care ministries and kind and others that are out there uh, and that can hopefully draw down additional grant funds to help us in this aspect as well. And of course, MANA, who does weekend backpacks, all of these things are all encompassed. We know how to do it if we've got to do it alone. I hope that won't be the case, but I know that regardless, we'll get it done just like we did during the pandemic. So I want to close by turning it over to Ms. Rodriguez Hernandez because I do know that we have some tech mod stuff to go over as well to just close us out. Uh, but did just want to say that again, um, I'm happy in seeing this budget because it is the first year of iteration of our commitment that is a long-standing 10-year commitment when it comes to revamping our education system throughout the state, but more importantly for where I represent here in Montgomery County. And I've seen that we've made so much progress, and I know that there's continued progress to be made that's gonna certainly answer the call of all of the issues that my colleagues have raised. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Ms. Rodriguez-Hernandez.
This is a great conversation. I don't want to delay the other items, so I will just quickly go over tech mod or technology modernization. Um, MCPS and the Board of Education requested an 8% increase for the FY23 to 28 CIP period from the approved FY21-26. The county executive included in his affordability reconciliation for MCPS a reduction in current revenue um, related to technology mod modernization. Uh, the committee has accepted that uh, non-recommended reduction in the county executive's affordability reconciliation and the uh, new total is 153000 for the six-year period and for fiscal year 23 there's only a $100,000 reduction in fiscal year 24 there's a $300,000 reduction and as we always do with the CIP we'll continue to, to evaluate those later years as we get to them so that that's the committee's recommendation great so, uh, so we have a committee recommendation before us can I get a motion to accept that recommendation so moved by Councilmember Rice seconded by Councilmember Jawando any discussion no discussion all those in favor please raise your hands and that is unanimous is that great all right thank you all very much uh, we now move on to the next item on the agenda which is a discussion regarding the Department of Recreation As Director Riley comes forward and before turning it over to the chair of our Fed Committee, I do want to make take a point of privilege. I uh, got an email from Ken Hartman just before this session started, and this I think is just an illustration of this department's um, really great leadership. So we found out late, uh, very recently, that the company that supplies the fireworks for the 4th of July uh, let us know that they were not going to be able to do so because of supply-demand issues. Uh, across the country and not surprisingly uh, the department got on the horn and contacted everybody imaginable and was able to identify a vendor that will allow us to be able to carry forward the 4th of July fireworks um, on a different date but still allow us to move forward and the public never sees the the work that goes into making sure that happens they just enjoy an event with their families as they should um, but I think it just underscores uh, the really great work of this department once again and uh, one of countless numbers of examples that I can speak about in the first person. So thank you so much, Director Riley, for being here. I'll turn it over to the chair of the Fed Committee to go over the committee recommendations. Well, thank you. I absolutely echo your praise for the department and its leadership. We are so fortunate to have a department that is um, staffed by people with a passion for community wellness, success, health, vitality, uh, justice. You know, that's the mission of our department, I think, in ways, ways that are not always so known by the, by the community. But for thousands and thousands of residents, you know, what they experience on a day-to-day -day basis is what the rec department is doing, and we're grateful for that. Our top line budget recommendations here are, are quite simple. The next packet will get into some program enhancements, but we are excited about the opening of the Aquatic Center, and we talked very, we got very finely grained about the timing, and uh, it appears that there's some, some potential savings in the budget related to the anticipated timing for the opening. So I'll turn that to you, Ms. Yao, um, and we can hear from the department, and then Next, we'll go into um, some of the enhancements that are proposed. Did you want to just talk about the Aquatic Center, or did you want to go through the? Oh, packet? please! I mean, go through, go through your recommendation, uh, the committee recommendations. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so, for fiscal year twenty-three, the executive is recommending fifty-five million one hundred ninety-one thousand eighty-four. Could you uh, pull the mic just a little closer, please? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, $55,191,084 for the Recreation Department in total expenditures. It's a 13.3% increase from the fiscal year 22 approved budget. That includes 569.39 FTEs. The 
committee recommended one reduction, and that's regarding uh, the department's lapse assumption for a total reduction of seven hundred eighty-two thousand fifty-seven dollars. That is a three. That's the average of three years in terms of unspent personnel costs for the department. Uh, there, are, the department anticipates adding at least twenty-two new positions, um, and that will have probably increase the likelihood of unspent personnel costs. The executive staff did not um, express any concerns about this added uh, lapse assumption. So that's the only decrease that the committee recommended. There was one increase that the Joint Fed and T&E Committee recommended, and that was a one-time funding of 350000 on the reconciliation list to acquire a wheelchair accessible vehicle for the department's senior programming. And otherwise, the committee recommended uh, the enhancements uh, that the executive recommended. Um, and, the, um, and these are the ones that are not involving out of school time activities, which will we'll come to next in the joint Fed ENC committee. But those, those enhancements include uh, senior programming for $250,000, as well as senior program support, $72,630. That's continuing uh, programming that the council had added through special appropriation. Uh, the Independence Day fireworks displays that Council President uh, Albernoz had just mentioned, as well as opening the South County Regional Recreation Aquatic Center. That's an amount of $2,300,000 and $12,000. Um, we had heard that there might be some savings, but it looks like substantial completion is still on track to happen in this current uh, calendar year. And because of the complexities of this particular facility, recreation does anticipate that um, bringing on merit staff in September and bringing seasonal staff on in January. So uh, it doesn't look like at this point in time there will be additional ah, savings. So the lapse was just general lapse. It wasn't specifically related to the timing. Of Correct. The okay, thank Correct. you. Correct. And that's it for the, com the Fed Committee's recommendations. Okay, great. Well, we could hear from Director Riley. And again, we're grateful <clears throat> the executive continued the programs that the council added for support for senior programming. And a brief note, as we discussed around the Transportation Services Improvement Fund, which is the fund that we generate from Uber and Lyft based on the 25% per trip fee that we charge to those companies, mm -hmm. uh, we have decided through the committee recommendation to focus that funding on creating a fleet of taxis that have wheelchair access. But we were, we, 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 REC had requested from that fund a wheelchair accessible vehicle for to support REC programming. And we'd very much like to see REC take advantage of that opportunity. And so we've added, as you said, to the REC list funding to purchase that vehicle for them. So, Director Riley. Thank you very much. Um, first, it wasn't me that bailed us out of the fireworks. The only other option was Robin running around the field with a sparkler. Um, and so it was really critical that we found somebody. And we did. We did. So it was my team. They, they made a lot of. That would be a slow run, sir. <laughs> um, so thank you. Um, I mean, it's been a great, even though this has been a challenging year and we're really looking forward to the opportunities, um, I think um, I heard a lot of great statements right with the um, public school system in front of us um, around the challenges of the pandemic, but I also heard a lot of opportunities. And I think we experienced those as well. Um, it made us think differently, react differently, serve differently, connect differently. And uh, we're really um, excited about the opportunity to continue that work into the next year. Um, we've done a lot of great relationship building that we had missed the opportunity to do before, and we will certainly be taking advantage of that in the next upcoming year. So thank you for your continued work. Um, I'm so respectful of your work and how you've made such a difference and made Montgomery Matters, and thank you in your next best life. Um, thank you for your service and work. Um, and uh, we're just looking forward to the opportunity next year. In terms of the bus, um, for us, I have the opportunity to sit on the Age-Friendly Committee, 
Um, and that fund has always sort of been out there um, and not being utilized. And it was a great opportunity for us to think differently about whether that bus would be something that we could um, utilize that funding to provide for us. We have one van that has one handicap lift and it's probably 15 years old. And this bus would have given us an opportunity to think differently, create opportunity to transport people with disabilities to our programs, to our pools, um, provide seniors mini trips for um, the daytime to go to a farmer's market, things like that, and also use it in the out of school time window to transport young people to soccer for change. Instead of taking two vans or three vans, we could take a bus. So hopefully we'll, we'll see it come off the reconciliation. But thank you for your work and we look forward to the next year. Thank you. Uh, just a couple questions. So, Director Riley, I know the primary has been moved to July 19th, which uh, I know has made things challenging with regards to summer camp operations. Can you talk a little bit about that? And, and there's not a lot we can do, uh, but what are the plans and yeah. how are we going to address it? Great, great question. Thank you. Um, you know, we built a great relationship with the Board of Elections over the pandemic. We had a lot of staff there, um, and so we connected them in different ways. Um, and they're very um, thoughtful and, and cooperative in, in working with us so that we can maintain some of our camp operations during the early voting. Uh, we'll, we'll move things into the social halls instead of the gyms. So we're really going to be um, very deliberate about making sure that we provide those summer opportunities for our youth. Um, and so I think we're in a, in a pretty good place with the elections. Still lots of challenges, but, but we'll get through it. That's great news. And Obviously, you all are going to play an important role, as you always have, in the social and emotional well-being of our children and youth. Can you just talk broadly about, it's a deep concern to all of us. Uh, we're tackling this from a number of different angles, uh, the expansion of the wellness programs, the addition of the social workers, the addition of the behavioral health specialists. But can you talk a little bit about the department's plan uh, to help address the needs of our youth? Yeah, I'll give you a couple quick examples. I mean, I think I talked briefly about building relationships and partnerships, and one of them is our Long Branch community, which has not had a summer camp in over two years, uh, and Caulfield as well. And so we have done some um, great bridge building, um, and we will be working with Adventist Community Health, um, Strathmore, uh, and others to do really amazing, um, credible work at Long Branch to provide kids an opportunity. And we're gonna do that in a lot of our summer camps. We're gonna do enrichment activities as part of the, the summer camp as well. Um, we know that kids need that social engagement. We saw it when basketball tipped off. I don't know if I had the opportunity to be at the first game and watching parents and kids have that first opportunity to play and engage with other, other uh, athletes was, was powerful. And, and that's the mission of this department is making those connections um, you know, I had uh, the opportunity to see Fashion Boot Camp a couple weeks ago um, mm -hmm. and seeing those kids just, and their parents and their families and friends um, connect with them. So we know that that's our work um, and we'll always continue to do that work. I appreciate that. And just the final thought for now is um, something that's often overlooked is the department is the largest employer of youth in, of any county agency uh, and many just organizations and businesses, period. Uh, and I know it's a responsibility the department takes very seriously in the development of these kids so that they can go on and do other things. Uh, could you just talk a little bit about sure. that moving forward, particularly in this challenging work environment that we find ourselves in? Yeah, it is a challenging work environment. I'll give you one really quick example. Um, we had a young man who came through our Teen Works program. I'm not sure if you remember him in your time. His name was Wilmer Flores. Mm. Um, Wilmer, um, great young man. He worked with us through Teen Works. He became a red shirt, a seasonal. He's going to graduate from the Fire Academy mm -hmm. on July 1st, and I will be there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he, Montgomery County, Fire, yeah. Montgomery yeah. County mm -hmm. Fire Academy. So he, he is, he's just one small example of, of the kids that we help build pipelines for. I heard that a little bit ago, too, uh, by making connections to them. Um, about a caring adult, showing them a pathway, <laughs> giving them all the wraparound services in terms of customer service, financial literacy. Um, and so we're really proud of that work and we'll continue to do that work. It is challenging hiring seasonal staff right now. I mean, we're, um, Tracy Anderson, who's to my left here, um, has been working tirelessly to help us facilitate job fairs and recruitment. We're working with WorkSource. Uh, we're working with public schools, and, and we're doing lots of things to really engage kids to get them to come work for us for this summer. Thank you. And just a point of privilege, I want to thank Council Members Navarro, Rice, 
and Reamer, um, because obviously crossed over, and you all understood, as previous councils did before, that the work that this department does is not just nice but not necessary, it's critical. Uh, and so uh, I look forward to carrying that legacy forward along with my colleagues and appreciate your work, Director Riley. Uh, we have a committee recommendation before us. Um, are there, is there a motion to accept that committee recommendation? Oh, Councilmember Rice. I just, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, because uh, you have been so instrumental in terms of answering the call when it comes to equity and social justice um, in expanding your programs, but also many people don't know, and so I just want to put in a commercial plug for you about the various things that you do, including the fashion show that you had to do virtually this year, but still put on and committed that allows kids, again, just as we talked about with MCPS, to see themselves in different kinds of roles, to be producers, to be uh, uh, fashion moguls in terms of creating fashion. Um, these are the kinds of things that, again, don't get talked about a lot, but do make a difference when you look at the smiling faces of all of those kids who feel so proud about the show that they put on, whether it's dealing with chill and kids who've never stepped foot on a ski slope before to be able to experience snowboarding or skateboarding now. The, two, the, the list is endless in terms of what it is that you're doing and breaking barriers that typically have been there for so many of our kids, mainly of color and of lower socioeconomic status and giving them opportunity. And I know that the former director knows this all too well, but I think that it's important for our public that is watching to know that encompassed in this very constrained budget are all of these unique and creative things that are reaching so many in our community that matter so much. Because again, as we talked about kids not being able to be what they can't see, you're giving them opportunities to see themselves in so many other roles. So thank you for that. Thank, thank, thank you. you. We have a great team and I'm very proud of their work. Well said. Councilmember Navarro. Absolutely. I want to thank your team. Um, I want to make sure that I'm on record <clears throat> really acknowledging and recognizing your dedication. And what Councilman Rice just said is so on point because what you do is, is quite magical. Um, and just to see the excitement on our young people's faces when they participate in these programs um, and the ability, as it was just described, to really kind of role play and experience particular things that perhaps they wouldn't do otherwise. Every time I step into one of the facilities, especially in particular areas of the county where we have worked so hard to bring those types of high quality facilities, every time I step into them and I just see everybody having a great time and engaging from you know very, very young children all the way to our seniors. It makes me feel so proud to live in this county. Um, and yes, we talk about you know parks, we, we talk about all of that, but it's that combination of this department and, and our president who led it for so ably for so long, but to really imagine how to provide those types of extraordinary opportunities for all of us. So I just truly want to thank you. I, I know because, you know, I have memories of long time ago when there were areas like the East County where we barely had anything and our young people stepped up to say, this is what we would like to see. And all of you put it together and it's still happening. Um, so it's, it's, it's really something to celebrate. And, and as it was also stated, your way to adapt during the pandemic was just masterful. Um, and, and it has made a big difference. So thank you so much for what, what you do, and what your team does, and what I know you will continue to do um, moving forward. It, it really does make a big difference. And, and it is kind of like the great equalizer. I, I see it all the time and it and it's just brings joy to my heart. Thank you very much. Thank you. And can I just say as a point of personal privilege, I, I'm so happy that Councilmember Leventhal's phone went off because it took me back <laughs> to this like, you know, nostalgia sort of experience. And I just, it was like a flashback. So thank you, Councilmember Leventhal. Yeah, I love that. You know, that's important. <laughs> love it. All right. Uh, so we have a committee recommendation before us. Uh, can I get a motion to accept that committee recommendation? Moved by Councilmember Friedson, seconded by Councilmember Reamer. 
uh, no discussion. So all those in favor, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous. Thank you very much, Director Riley and team. Thank you. All right, that takes us on to uh, the next item on our agenda, um, which is item 43, school-based programs, out-of-school time programs, and skills for the future NDA. Ms. Yao, or uh, Chairman Raymer, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, and these are joint committee items uh, with EC. Um, Chair Rice and I convene these uh, meetings together. Um, I'll just, very big headline here. We are, the council has really stepped up on youth sports. And we are recognizing that the county is lacking in affordable, accessible sports opportunities for kids. And we're trying to rebuild what was once the norm, that in a variety of sports, there were rec department administered teams and leagues that engaged thousands and thousands of kids and provided them with a wonderful opportunity and some of them to develop skills that would lead to a future as an athlete. Um, but for many, just a better life. And over the last several decades, that has changed. And the nature of sports is now largely provided by private organizations. Um, and private organizations will continue to provide sports. But building on uh, the intense interest in sports at this council, and I really want to thank my colleagues here. You, you're all, um, you know, just visionaries. We're, we're seeking to add some funding to build out large-scale programming uh, for sports generally, but also, as, as we've previously discussed, um, some specific leagues and teams that will really appeal to young, uh, young women, uh, to girls, and to ensure that they have opportunities to participate in sports that are intentional about their needs and um, providing them with a path. So I think that is kind of the, the high-level view. Um, and then also, we have recommended some funding for the Kid Museum. And uh, that the Kid Museum has become like an innovation lab for MCPS. And MCPS is very enthusiastic about their partnership and funding here will help scale up the really remarkable work uh, that has been put forward by the Kid Museum and help reach thousands and thousands of kids through the schools. So Kid has built over the years a very effective, successful partnership with MCPS, and this program seeks to expand that to kids and schools where they're primarily lower income, uh, they are don't have the resources at home to have access to these kinds of educational life opportunities. And working together, KID and MCPS want to, to bring that to them. So uh, I'll now turn it, and then there, there's a number of other critical expansion areas within the executive's recommended budget for Rec Zone, EBB, we're grateful for those. And I think we've added on a little bit there uh, for some parent engagement and things like that. So. Uh, back, okay, Great. back to my co-chair. Thank you, Anon. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair Reamer. And um, let me just say that this is incredibly important because, again, as we talk about equity and leveling the playing field, it is so important for us on so many levels. Um, it's very interesting because I remember uh, when I went to um, South Lake for the very first time and had a chance to talk to some of the parents there about why it was that they were there at that school when the bell sounded. Uh, and they talked about the fact that they were concerned about gang recruitment and about drugs. These are elementary school kids. And those are the reasons why they were stepping up and doing what they were doing to play a part in terms of ensuring the safety of their kids and why programs like the Dream Academy and Excel Beyond the Bell and Linkages to Learning and all these programs matter so much to these communities. It truly is that partnership and what the council president said in terms of highlighting how much more we do beyond the school budget that matters to these families and to these kids. And I'll just close by saying this, um, when it comes to girls sports leagues, I just had the opportunity uh, to be with one of our uh, girls basketball teams that is absolutely phenomenal and doing great things but I imagine how many more girls could actually benefit 
um, from having more teams like that to be able to highlight uh, the great things that are going on in so many sports where women are oftentimes shut out or marginalized. Um, we remember the Olympics uh, when we heard from the top elite athletes about how they didn't even have access to the gym that their male counterparts had. And it became a big deal in terms of then finding a space for them to ensure that they had the same workout facilities. We are doing that same work here in this county to ensure that we have that same sort of equitable support for our sports across the board, especially when it comes to many of our girls' sports. So I really wanna thank you, Councilmember Reamer, not only for your partnership, but your leadership and for everyone on the council uh, for continuing to support these initiatives that mean so much for so many in our community. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you both. And just a point of privilege, Carl Lesser is in the audience, the executive director of Kid Museum, as we were mentioning the importance of that wonderful organization. So Ms. Yao, I'll turn it over to you to walk us through the packet. So the chairs of the joint committee uh, did a great job kind of highlighting some of the key points. I'll, I'll just provide a little bit more context for, for those uh, decisions from the joint committee. So as far as adding items to the reconciliation list, the, com the committee recommended putting in 40,000 for parent engagement programming associated with the EBB elementary program. Um, there, for programs that were added in the last budget, as well as proposed new programs for fiscal year 23, this component was left out. And so, um, the recommendation is to put $40,000 um, to provide that kind of that additional support for those programs. There's also a recommendation to provide funding in two tranches to support the Play Montgomery uh, and the Girls Sports Leagues uh, programming that Councilmember Reamer and Councilmember Rice had, had discussed. 500000 is to support Play Montgomery. As the council knows, the 500,000 was appropriated with CARES funding to the department um, through um, <clears throat> for youth sports. And they used that money to support this initiative, which increase, which, is, which addresses um, disparities among historically marginalized programs and groups. So the 500,000 was used to you know, lower fees, continue soccer for, soccer for change at the middle school level, um, expand sports in local neighborhoods and communities through local providers. Um, and so this funding is needed to actually continue those efforts, which then also support the implementation of girls sports leagues for 250,000. Um, it would again allow the implementation of leagues that would, um, that are um, in sports that are popular with girls, um, so that those could be stood up in fiscal year 23. The last item that they recommended in terms of funding is is for the Kid Museum in two tranches. One is 400,000 that would expand programming to 960 K through three students at 16 schools, um, and then. $206,364 would support development of curriculum for grades four to five, and that would be implemented in, a, in fiscal year 24 in the future. So those are the items that the Joint Committee recommended be put on the reconciliation list. In addition, the committee reviewed uh, and recommended approval of what the county executive had put in um, for these out of school time and partnerships with uh, MCPS and other organizations. So you'll, on page two of your packet, there's a chart that um, shows about $2.2 million of, fun of uh, funding for services that the council was instrumental in adding, either by special appropriation or the department's base. And that includes community-based supports, uh, wraparound services for summer school, expelled beyond the Bell Elementary, kids day out, non-school day programming, um, extended summer camps at the end of the summer when 
you know, summer camps end and before schools begin. So those are some of the things that the executive included in his budget, but again, we're, uh, we're uh, how do I say, the council played an instrumental role in, in, in um, starting. In addition, the county executive is recommending two new rec zone programs at two high schools for $259,631, and that would also require $81,394 for uh, position to support those programs, as well as two new EBB elementary programs for $667,564, and continued funding of $300,000 for the Bienvenidos Newcomers uh, Initiative Services. Um, finally, the committee also recommended approval of the exec executive's proposed funding for the Skills for the Future NDA. Um, the recommended amount is $271,360. Great. Uh, just very quickly, I associate myself with the comments made earlier by Council Members Reamer and Rice. Um, I am excited about the new Sports Commission that we are going to enact later this year, which I think will help maximize and make further recommendations to this and future bodies uh, to get us back where we were uh, in terms of providing recreational sports activities and opportunities. So uh, we have a committee recommendation before us. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous. Thank you. All right, we move on to uh, item number 44, which is the Police Accountability Board, NDA. And I'll turn it over to the chair of our Public Safety Committee, uh, Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As you might recall, uh, when the committee voted three to zero to uh, accept the approval uh, as, as amended by the executive, Ms. Farag once again has done a fabulous job with the packet. And with your approval, uh, I will turn it over to her, or unless Dr. Stoddard has any opening uh, statements. Ms. Farag, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you mentioned, this is for the new Police Accountability Board. The council just passed a bill that um, enacts and enables the creation of this board. It is mandated by state law, House Bill 670 from 2021, which was um, part of a body of, of different bills that created a police reform package at the state level. It is meant to look over any types of complaints against police officers that involve the community members. So it could be lodged by a community member or it could be something that has been generated internally to the departments. It will be responsible for looking at all the police departments within the county. Uh, when it initially came across the street March 15th as part of the recommended 23 operating budget, it had about $100,000 in it as a placeholder because the council was still considering the bill at this level. Um, he did provide a April 19th amendment, budget amendment, that adds 336000 for a total um, funding of 436541 That reflects the um, payments that are made to both the Administrative Charging Committee members as well as the Police Accountability Board members. Um, it also provides for two salaried positions. One is an Executive Director at a Manager 2 level and another is an Administrative Specialist 2. Um, the total amount budgeted for the executive director starting salary, which does reflect a 90-day startup delay, was approximately $90,000 with $24,000 in benefits. I was initially concerned that this might be too low. Um, if you annualized that, it would be about $120,000. Um, it would be, I was concerned it would be too low to actually recruit the type of person you needed to be able to stand up something of this importance uh, moving forward for the entire county. And so it was discussed at um, committee and they did, I did recommend that they look more seriously at the midpoint level for hiring, which is about $133,000, um, which the committee did agree to. OMB is advised that this can be done without changing the actual um, appropriation because they have some leeway as far as um, you know, increasing the salary at this point. Um, since that can be handled in existing resources, uh, the, as um, Chair Katz had stated before, the committee had recommended 3-0 to approve as amended by the executive. Uh, thank you, Ms. Farag. Uh, Chair, Chair McCast, do you want to say anything? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so just, I'll just note very quickly, I really want to express appreciation of my colleagues and all the stakeholders out there. Um, 
we were way ahead of the game in terms of the establishment of the Police Accountability Board, and we have received acknowledgments from other parts uh, and other jurisdictions asking us how we did what we did. Um, and I really want to thank Dr. Stoddard and the executive branch for their partnership and alliance here. I think we landed in as good a place as anybody could have ever imagined or asked for. And while the we've laid the foundation and now the recruitment and the execution of the work is even more important than laying the foundation, but I'm particularly um, pleased with where we landed. So I just wanted to express that. Um, we have a committee recommendation before us. All those in favor of accepting the committee recommendation, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the capital improvement program of the Department of Correction and Rehabilitation. This was rescheduled from uh, May 11th. And I'll turn it back over to the chair of our Public Safety Committee, Chairman Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The um one, we did this in two different uh, at two different times. On March third, uh, the committee recommended three zero for the approval of all projects other than the criminal justice complex, uh, which is at seven locks. Uh, we met again on May second. You weren't able to be there, Mr. President, but uh, it was a two zero vote um, on the um, approval for the uh, uh, the criminal justice complex. The committee is going to follow up later in the fall for uh, all stakeholders to better understand uh, the the uh, the design and, and what is scheduled to begin until the fall of 2023. I, I want to be very clear on the uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, the the criminal the the seven locks site. I am very much in favor of the purpose of the of the uh, restoration center i um but i do have great concern about where the center could be located and that's at this point the seven lock site is in the middle of a of a uh, residential area um if montgomery in my opinion if montgomery county did not own that site i sincerely doubt that anyone would suggest that the county buy it to put it there and it's a freestanding, it would be a new freestanding building. Uh, and so it's in the city, of, it has you know, several issues associated with it. It is in the city of Rockville, and we need to involve the city. We need to involve the residents. We need to, uh, uh, the Department of, uh, the, the people from the Department of, of Corrections and Rehabilitation, and they're sitting there and they do a wonderful job, and I want to publicly thank them. Department of Health and Human Services, Department of General Services. The, the list goes on and on who needs to be there. And we need to have, as I've called for, a, 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 a citizens committee to receive information and misinformation because of the information and the misinformation that is out there. They, we need to discuss the security, the transportation, et cetera. There is a place, I don't believe it's at Seven Locks, but there is a place where this would be most, uh, um, it, would do, it would be most impressive. And, and I, not that everything should ever be on Neville Street, because it, it shouldn't be. But right now, Neville Street has the pre-trial services, it has pre-release center, it has many services there, and I don't know about anyone else, but I personally have not received any concern or complaint about those services that are on the in that much more of a of a uh, of a, uh, 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 more commercial area or or uh, uh, a non residential area. So with that, I we, we the committee did vote two to zero for this site uh, for this uh, use, and I do know that we were considering or they were looking at whether or not because they're going for state funding whether or not it had to be site specific in the state fund and i don't know that we've gotten an answer on that yes i just wanted to clarify chair katz are we speaking of the restoration center itself or the criminal justice i, I meant the restoration center okay yeah. so that's not before the council right now we're just going to look at the criminal justice complex as part of the corrections budget and i'll just briefly go over the seven lock site um, it had three projects situated there in the current cip one is the criminal justice complex, which would handle the jail functions that are currently functioning there now. The uh, next one is the restoration center, which was handled by HHS committee. 
Um, that is more of a deflection program. It had been part of the CJC, but that got split off new for this year. So it's two separate functions, two separate departments. Um, and also there was some discussion about the bus depot there too. Um, but today we're just talking about the criminal justice complex and the rest of DOC DOCR's CIP. And I'm happy to move through those projects if you'd like. As far as I'm concerned, please. Sure. So there are four projects, two of which are new. The first one is the CJC, which we just discussed. Um, that's newly funded this year for $78.6 million. Um, and as Chair Katz had mentioned, this initially went before the Public Safety Committee on March 3rd. They had recommended approval of all projects other than the CJC, and they brought it back on May 2nd to get some more information. And they had approved it. They had recommended approval to zero but they did want to follow up later in the fall with all stakeholders to better understand both the planned design and operations. I did want to stress the design for this project is not scheduled to begin until the fall of 2023. I had some concerns about design myself, uh, which I'll get into. Um, this project in one form or the other has been in the CIP since 1997. Okay, the original uh, building there, I believe was built in 1961 or 68. Um, but when you went to a two jail facility plan in 1995, they knew that some sort of renovation or rehab of the current Maryland or the Montgomery County Detention Center had to occur, right? So it's been in there some form or another for over 20 years. Um, sometimes it was in as a renovation, sometimes it was in as a brand new facility. It's gone back and forth. Right now, this is a brand new facility. Um, in the last CIP, it, it had included the Restoration Center. They have been split apart, and now the Criminal Justice Complex project has been pared down to deal specifically with jail operations. Um, they have the central um, processing unit there. They have pretrial operations. They have the police department's warrant and fugitive section. This is where they maintain central inmate records. And they also keep inmate property at this location. This is where people are brought once they are arrested. They get assessed for a variety of different issues like mental health issues, um, drug and alcohol programs, and they figure out placement at that point. They have their pretrial initial hearing at that point. Um, where they could be recommended for release or kept on bond. And then if they don't bond out within 72 hours, they are transported up to MCCF up in Clarksburg. So this will be a smaller footprint. It is fully funded this time for the first time for about 78 million. Um, design again is scheduled for the fall of 2023 and construction is expected in the spring of 2026. Now, jail operations have been changing dramatically over the past 10 years even. The populations are lower, but they're a much more complex population to manage. Uh, the jail is under a state-mandated medication-assisted treatment program, which is one new thing to help people who are, are on management for opioid addictions and other types of substance use issues. Um, the Department of Correction did do a master confinement master facility confinement study back in 2014 that was trying to project population needs up through 2035. Now that's getting closer um, than I'd like it to at this point, but it also is trying to project the types of operations they need. So that was one of the concerns that I brought up at the initial public safety committee work session is would the um, committee like to follow up in the fall and really understand what their needs are going forward, whether or not there needs to be a new re a reassessment of how MCDC plays into the whole jail process and operation. Who do they house there for 72 hours? Uh, what types of um, programming do they need there? What types of treatment do they need there? So I had initially recommended that, which the committee did agree with. Um, it is a smaller footprint, again, where MC on the same piece of property is where MCDC is currently located, performing the same functions. And there are pictures of that site on page five of the second packet. Um, the second program is the second project is very much related, which deals with the MCDC renovation. That is the current building that is housed there now, performing all these same functions, and that was for $4.8 million. And because the criminal justice complex has been delayed over the years several different times, this project was added to the CIP in FY21. This project has been renovating certain areas of the existing facility, and it's demolishing vacant space, including the high rise tower five vacant modular units and a CIU pod. Construction started in mid-2021 and it's scheduled for completion in the fall of 2022. Uh, it is just slightly delayed and that actually has moved funding into the six-year period due to, due to the modest project delays at this point. But again, this is 
This is a um, facility that houses people 24 seven. They cannot leave. You have um, employees there have limited ability to leave. The habi how habitable it is really matters at this point, you know, keeping the environment stable, keeping uh, water system, sewer system stable, and they have put in millions of dollars in order to stabilize this site at this point. So those temporary renovations are due to be completed this fall. And again, it was really based on the approval of the criminal justice complex. The two new projects include Wi-Fi for MCCF, which is the Montgomery County Correctional Facility up in Clarksburg, and Community Corrections for 936,000. Those, this new project provides for the design and implementation of wireless internet at MCCF and community corrections. Um, and it installs various networks, switches and Wi-Fi throughout these facilities, including common areas like the housing pods, the medical suite and administrative areas. Um, implementing Wi-Fi at these sites will enhance uh, implementation of the new electronic health records system. It will improve work productivity and provide advanced learning technology for the staff and inmate population. The implementation of the MCCF housing areas is programmed for FY23. Um, MCCF administrative areas and MCDC Wi-Fi upgrades are programmed for FY24 and community corrections is programmed for FY25. And the last project is new as well and this is an MCCF refresh of $4 million. That facility up in Clarksburg was built in 2003 and it has had limited capital improvements uh, despite significant wear and tear. And this project is providing for the planning of a refresh project that includes medical unit modifications, remediation of clogged vents in the inmate cells. Uh, the medical unit modifications will include moving a nurse and correctional officer station to improve sight lines, increases male, female inpate, inmate capacity, increases um, inmate holding cell space and other adjustments needed to accommodate implementation of the state mandated medication assisted treatment program that I had mentioned earlier. It also provides for paint through the facility and carpet replacement in the administrative areas. Um, initial planning is scheduled in FY23. Uh, the modifications to the medical unit and the vent remediation is scheduled for FY24 and FY25 and repainting the facility and carpeting is programmed for FY26 and FY27. And again, the committee recommended approval as submitted. Yep. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just very briefly, as the district council member, I can't uh, say how much I appreciate the public safety focusing on MCCF uh, and really uh, looking at ways in which we can continue to refresh that facility. Been there a number of times and it certainly is dated and it's time for us to certainly make sure that uh, those surroundings are much better for uh, our folks that are, uh, that are being housed there. I will say that when it comes to Wi-Fi, this is incredibly important because of a new initiative uh, that's being pushed forth uh, with uh, WorkSource Montgomery, which is the Coding Our Way Home program, uh, which will allow for individuals to actually receive uh, coding training. I really want to thank Director Talley uh, and all of her staff for working with WorkSource Montgomery hand in hand to create this program that I think will actually become a national model. Uh, there's been talk at the National Association of Counties uh, and with uh, our U.S. Uh, Secretary of Labor uh, in trying to make sure that we can highlight this as an example of ways in which we can engage uh, our incarcerated population in being attached to uh, different career pathways. All of these conversations tend to blend together, and so it's really nice to continue to see that we're not forgetting about those uh, that happen to be incarcerated, that we still need to get them onto better pathways so that they can choose better options for themselves besides uh, committing crimes. And so from that standpoint, just really wanted to say I appreciate it and how important this is. All these things oftentimes are linked together. So thank you for that to the Public Safety Committee. Thank you. Director Talley, would you like to say a few words? Well, well good morning, everyone. Um, let me start first by just thanking the council <clears throat> for your support of our department and uh, you know addressing our needs. Um, that we need in order to carry out a public safety se public safety mission on a daily basis. Um, when we think about the Seven Locks facility, we know that it is 60 years old, and if MCCF is dated, you can imagine what MCDC is. And so, um, the significant maintenance that interferes with our daily operations on a daily basis, as we try to patch and and fix and patch and fix for a facility that is just deteriorating. And um, it results in us having a subpar work environment for our staff who do a tough job in the first place 
uh, subpar environment for our um, incarcerated population who live here every single day. And, um, you know, when you think about coming into work every day as a correction officer, you think about what's facing you. You don't want to think about what's my work environment. Are we going to be um, hit with a flood today? Mm -hmm. And these are some of the things that we've been hit with um, all the time and even most recently, flooding, leaking roofs. Um, we weren't generated power for five weeks for a correctional facility. I couldn't sleep. I'm just going to tell you. Um, I couldn't sleep. And so these are things that um, play into morale um, when you're faced with um, ongoing maintenance and odors that we cannot resolve. <clears throat> and you want people to feel safe in their work environment. You want our incarcerated uh, population to feel safe in the environment that they're living in. And so it becomes an equity issue when, we, when we're when we not resolving um, and giving people access to and providing for their care. And so I just wanted to highlight how the new facility um, will take care of this finally. Um, and so we can move away from the patch and fix because we're scared to touch one one area. If, if someone's taking a shower upstairs, there's leaking downstairs. Um, and if you fix one toilet, and, and I'm not minimizing this, maybe 12 cells will go out. And so we can do better. Um, we have to do better. Um, and so the new facility will, will help us address this. And we just look forward at a time where we can position ourselves to take advantage of state aid to move this project forward. So thank you so much for your support. I will share with you that this is my final year as serving in this role. And so I just want to thank you all so very much. What? <laughs> what? What did you just say, Angela? I'm I think sorry. We're gonna have to I, lock I, you I, don't, I just I wasn't sure if I had the opportunity to have you all at one time um, to be able to tell you that. Right, yeah, it'll be 32 and a half years, and um, I just want to thank yeah. you. Um, you come to a point, and I don't want to get emotional, where you've done a lot, and um, I just want to thank you so much. If we had put you on the program first, would you stay? Yes. <laughs> 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 um, oh, that's well, terrible. I'm pick myself off the floor here, Director I'm, Talley. I'm sorry. Uh, just no. I, I uh, let me just make a couple of comments. Sure. Um, I have personally been aware of your work, having served with you in the previous yes. administration, and um, I'm going to get emotional just thinking <laughs> about your leadership, particularly these last two and a half years, because it has been hell. Oh, it has absolute hell. Mm -hmm. um, dealing with everything that you have had to deal with. The staffing concerns, which remain acute, the recruitment and mm -hmm. retention issues, which are directly related to what we just described with, with regards to the uh, conditions mm -hmm. moving forward. So um, you have heroically stepped forward, and you're the kind of humble person who will acknowledge your team, which is appropriate, mm -hmm. but we would not be here without your leadership. Thank and you. I know Director Green felt the same way, mm -hmm. uh, and we all felt so good about the transition plan that was in place, because mm -hmm. uh, these are difficult jobs um, on a good day, uh, for sure. So um, we will have to process and think <laughs> through how we can appropriately acknowledge the heroism you have shown in your leadership for those 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. um, but this body and this community can't thank you enough um, thank for you. choosing this profession and for doing it so extraordinarily well for so long. Thank so you thank so you, much. Director Talley. Thank you. You and you're only as strong as your team, mm -hmm. and uh, we wouldn't have made it through COVID without the buy-in from our staff and the dedication of our staff that come to work all the time, every day. Didn't have a choice. Our correctional officers, our nurses, case managers, uh, correctional dietary officers, and we took on multiple roles in order to keep things operating because we had to. We're 24/7. That's what we do. That's what we sign up for. Um, and so I thank them for making you know, my job a lot easier um, during difficult times. Thank you so much, Director Thank Talley. Mm -hmm. um, Councilmember Navarro followed by Councilmember Rice. Well, Director Talley, I mean, you know, yeah, it is, it is, I don't want to get emotional either. <laughs> um, because I think that we, we, we do this a lot, you know, we just, we just kind of gloss over extraordinary crises and the sustained um, impact of like, you know, what we just experienced cannot be minimized. And, you know, when I, when I, the minute I heard you say that, I, you know, part of me was like, well, duh, of course, why wouldn't you? 
you have given Montgomery County such amazing, amazing like dedication and extraordinary service. And I just, I guess my heart just breaks because I feel like, you know, you, what you've done, what you've demonstrated, particularly during this crisis, is exactly what we what we need. Is that kind of leadership that is just so much from the heart, and it's about as as it was stated, is about elevating your team, and it's about fighting, fighting for what you know it's right. And so it it you know on the one hand I am devastated because I I felt like okay we're on we're you know. We're on our way here as we are recovering and as we're making these investments and your leadership will take us to you know where we need to be and i'm sure your team felt the same way but on the other hand i cannot blame you and i'm just going to put it out there i think especially as women of color working in these spaces um where you know we toss the term equity around a lot but really truly the devastation that many People who are in these types of leadership positions where you know that the population you're serving is disproportionately of color, it, it does wear you out emotionally, you know, physically, mentally. Uh, but there you are always shining through and leading through all of that additional baggage that I think some of us have to carry. And so I just want to honor you and I want to, you know, express that because many times we tend to not call it for what it is and it's not to say that our entire staff you know our teams our leaders are all always stepping but there is a particular burden that leaders of color carry in spaces where the population is predominantly disproportionately of color that has to deal with all of this and so you are somebody to to your role model to so many uh, and, uh, and and I wish you just all the best because at the end of the day, you got to take care of yourself and you've put it out there. And, you know, I, I applaud you for recognizing that and for um, leading the way the way that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words. Thank you. Councilmember Rice. So I remember when I first met you with Director Wallenstein. And so it's, 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 it's one of those where, and, and even then, Art was like, look, you know, I've got some great stars. And it's the same thing that you just said about it's the team that I have that does great things, right? Um, but it's not just that. It's about also creating a workplace to where folks know and understand the mission which is to reduce recidivism, to make sure that we're addressing the needs of the inmates when they're there with you and that they leave you better than they came in. And you remain committed to that. When I sat there at graduation ceremonies, when people had their GEDs and they got certifications, all of those kinds of things were changing the paradigm of those individuals and putting them on better pathways so that our community would be a better place. So please, while you are being humble, do accept the credit of what it is that you have done and the dedication that you have given to people to change people's lives and trajectories that have made our community a better and safer place. That is what you have dedicated with all of your decades of service to Montgomery County. So Director Talley, I just wanna say thank you uh, on behalf of all the folks who don't think a lot about what it is that you do and how it really keeps them safe at night, uh, keeps this as a community that is one that we can continue to say is one of the best to live, work, and play. It happens because of so many things, including a great director of our Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Rice. And I wish you the best as well. Thank you. Thank you too, Councilmember Tarabaro. Thank you. Uh, just in time, Councilmember Reedson. Thank you. Well, uh, wow. Uh, uh, certainly was an important topic, and I think all of us uh, are, are are still processing. I'll say, uh, shortly after joining the council, uh, when Director Green let us know that he was leaving and what a loss uh, his leadership was, uh, every one of us said the same thing. Well. At least we have you, you know, no, no problem. We're going to be okay. It's all, you know, we're going to hold hands and, and, and we're going to, we're going to be all right. Uh, and so I'm not sure what the answer is now, but, but hopefully you can, uh, you, you can help us. Uh, but it's a tremendous loss. Your leadership has been 
hugely important for the department, not just in your current role, but in all the roles that you have played up to this point, because you know now you're uh, here responding on behalf of the agency, but the work that you have been doing over the many years that you've been doing it has just been exceptional and greatly appreciated. And certainly the line of work that you are in and your team is in, it's not easy work. I mean, this is really, really tough, tough work that you take home every single day and every single night. And, and we all just really, really appreciate uh, that. But there'll be plenty of time to celebrate your career and figure out what in the world we're going to do uh, when you uh, when you move on. And, and certainly we need uh, a, a lot of help and support and uh, 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 maybe some uh, uh, some circles to, to, to talk through it. But I did have a, a question specifically, or at least just a clarification, because I think it's important. Um, we had a long discussion about the Seven Locks facilities pre at the previous discussion. There have been changes to what we're approving today. There was, you know, reference to it earlier. I just think it's very important for those who are are, are watching, so everybody can kind of follow. If you could, uh, Ms. Frog, just clarify exactly what we are approving here, what the recommendation is uh, to approve the the committee, and then explain what the subsequent subsequent decision points are going to be and what the process is going to be for the other items that we're not approving uh, here today, but that are you know potentially related to these topics. I think that would be helpful. So there are three county projects that are slated for, for construction on the Seven Locks site. Today before you, we're only talking about the criminal justice complex, which is the jail, which is um, central processing unit where inmates are brought when they're arrested. Um, and you know, certain different things happen to them before they either bond out or they get moved up to MCCF. Um, we are not talking about the Restoration Center, which is an HHS project, and we're not talking about the bus depot either. I'm afraid I don't know the current status of those two projects. I had checked in last week, and at least the bus depot was still under council consideration, and I don't know if you've discussed that further. I appreciate it. So the other two items that we had extended conversation about, the bus depot in particular, right not before us today we're going to have a process to determine how to proceed on those those are a bit more long term the item before us today we're starting as early as you know the, a few months into the fiscal year and we're going to be approving that uh today well the criminal justice that, complex design doesn't even start until the fall of 2023 they have undergone oh it's a sorry it's calendar year i was thinking fiscal year 23. sorry sorry that's it's, and, my, it's my fault i my it was my misunderstanding and it's my understanding it's a two-year process in order to apply for the state matching funds and they're one year into that process at this point and the state matching funds are specifically for the central processing unit the, the jail effectively Correct. what yes. people know is the jail not for the other two items Okay, so I just wanted to clarify that because I think right. there could have been some confusion based on uh, you know our prior conversation and then coming back, and so I'm glad that that's been clarified. Appreciate the the work of, of council staff, and thank you again for for all of your work, and and certainly look forward to the opportunity to properly uh, celebrate and offer our gratitude for all your service to the county. Thank you, Director. Thank you so much. Thank you. Last person in the queue is Councilmember Jawando. Director Talley. Um, yeah, that was that was the surprise. Uh, you know, for much of my term, we were on speed dial um, when we're working all the shared shared concern for inside outside warm handoff, all the programming that comes from Rice and Cats, and all of us are really concerned about making sure that knowing most of your uh, residents are coming out and going to be residents of Montgomery County again or our region. And we have to do all that we can to make sure we put them on the best path towards reentry. Um, and I just want to thank you. I know we'll do it in a more formal way, but you know it's just so indicative of your leadership to come in here and talk about the needs of the facility and your staff and belabor those points. And then at the end, tuck in. This will be my last time. <laughs> that's just how. That's that's how you are. Um, and I saw you with your cane in here walking in. You didn't address it. I, was, I don't even know what happened with that. I'm, we're going to need to catch up. Knee surgery. Well, you didn't have to say it, but I just, I don't mind. It's, it's indicative of <laughs> you put other people before yourself. Uh, and that's what we all try to do up here, put the residents uh, of the Montgomery County ahead of us and think about them. And I just want to thank you for your deep, deep commitment and, and your team's commitment to that in very difficult times. So uh, 
really appreciate it. We'll, we'll, I'm sure, I'm, I know the council president will make sure that we more formally honor you at a later date, but, but thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Director, I hate to ask, but when is, when are you planning on making the transition? Uh, January 1st of 2023. Okay. So we do have plenty of time. Good. Six months. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, Mr. I, President, if I could. Yes, um, please. Rachel with OMB. I just wanted to um, clarify one point on the Restoration Center. I believe that has been approved by full council. Um, it's come up already, so I just wanted to clarify that. And then also reiterate a point that Director, Director Talley made regarding um, the criticality of state aid for this project um, and how important it is to keep the project schedule on track as we've, um, as the county executive has recommended. We do feel like we're kind of in a special, unique time in terms of the availability of state aid right now, and we want to position ourselves to take full advantage of that. Got it. <clears throat> Thank you for that clarification. Um, all right, we have a committee recommendation before us. All those in favor of the committee recommendation, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Um, colleagues, it's 1230, but I think we should just keep going because we've got the 3 o'clock. wouldn't make sense to break before the 3 o'clock. Um, so thank you all. I know we're covering a lot of bases today. Uh, next up uh, is item number 45, which is libraries. And um, we're going to be turning over to the lead for libraries in a moment. Um, but I just want to say how appreciative we all are when he accepted this nomination to be lead for libraries. We didn't realize he would go all in, uh, but that is exactly what he has done. Uh, and we appreciate his visit of all the respective libraries and had the chance to make a couple of cameos during some of the reading program that he was able to initiate during the pandemic during some tough times. Um, so really appreciate your leadership. Uh, Council Member Jawando, and um, I'll defer briefly to Chairman Rice uh, to make a few comments and then uh, turn it over to Council Member Jawando uh, to walk us through uh, the next phase of the packet. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, I, I equally want to thank uh, uh, Council Member Jawando, who's our lead for libraries. Um, libraries have always been an integral part uh, of everything that we do. Uh, they have been there at the forefront and continue to be a place where we need to ensure uh, that we uh, continue to support expansion and access for so many in our community uh, who value um, the role that our libraries play. Um, it is one in which uh, we certainly are always constrained uh, in terms of truly being able to address so many of the issues that we have, so much so that we went from complete renovations of our libraries to refresh projects because, one, we didn't want to take out those uh, very vital uh, services from our community for so long a period of time. Uh, and then, two, from an economic standpoint, we certainly wanted to make sure that we were balancing uh, the needs while still being able to be responsive to some of the uh, challenges we see with our aging facilities. And so I think we've landed in a really good place of continuing to have these refresh projects uh, that certainly allow for us to uh, address, you know, both of those concerns. I will just say that um, as we always are looking to be creative in the ways in which we uh, move forward uh, our uh, government buildings uh, whether it's uh, looking at affordable housing options, whether it's looking at child care, um, all kinds of things are always on the table for us and should be uh, when it comes to how it is that we are looking uh, at feasibility of moving some of these projects forward. I really want to thank uh, DGS, who always does a great job in working with us as well, uh, as we brainstorm these crazy ideas uh, of things that we want to do uh, to help move so many of the priorities in our county forward. And so with that, I'll turn it back to you to turn it to our lead for libraries, Councilmember Juwanda. Thank you. Just one last point of privilege, and I'm sure Councilmember Juwanda will mention this too, but I was immensely impressed the way libraries stepped forward during the pandemic to provide test kits uh, and the organization that went behind that. As the chair of the HHS committee, um, I was just so immensely impressed with the way the staff came forward. Not surprised, uh, given the leadership, um, but really just want to express that appreciation. Uh, I will now turn it over to Councilmember Jawando to uh, make some comments and then turn it over to staff to walk us through the packet. Thank you, Mr. President. Could, couldn't agree more. And uh, Director Pasalo is not here with us today. It's a fairly non-controversial operating budget. 
Um, and uh, so, uh, but I appreciate and want to echo your comments about just the how hard the library staff has worked. Uh, I mentioned this when we did it in committee, but I'll mention it here again. I was at a CVS and someone was going to buy COVID tests and some, a resident said, no, 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 just go to the library. Mm -hmm. Just go get them at the library. And, and just an example of the work, and I know several of you also helped pass those out and participated. So it's just they've done that and so much more. Um, the operating budge, budget, which I'll, I'll turn to Ms. Chen in a, in a moment, uh, county executive sent over an increase, which the committee unanimously approved, uh, mostly to help with closing the vacants, filling the vacancies, a million and a half dollars for that. Um, there are 400 FTEs at the libraries, about 100 of those spots are open right now, and we know, like with the rest of county government, we're trying to make sure we accelerate and they're making progress. So this will help with that. $900,000 for collections to help with the ebook wait times, um, which can be up to eight weeks or more now, and we really want to, uh, it's one of the things that's been a big increase during the pandemic. Uh, a lot of people reading more on their Kindles and, and the like. And the, the one addition uh, was that the committee unanimously put uh, $320,000 on the reconciliation list in two tranches to address the expansion uh, of the world languages uh, uh, program. And that was a unanimous committee recommendation. Um, and Director Vassallo at that time talked about that was an enhancement they had requested, wasn't, a, wasn't included in the base budget, but, uh, and as Councilmember Navarro comes back, that was such a big uh, point of uh, pr uh, privilege for her to talk about the world languages and all of us just agreed that that's really important. Um, Ms. Chen, anything I left out on the operating budget? No. no. Okay. okay, there you go. <laughs> so I think the first thing to do before we turn to the CIP would just to be to take a motion to approve, or if there's any discuss, I'll make a motion or someone make a motion to approve the committee recommendation for the operating budget for libraries. Uh, as Councilmember Navarro reminded me, because I screwed it up earlier, we don't actually need a motion uh, since there's already a committee recommendation. There we go, okay. Um, but, um, but before we go there, uh, I do have at least one colleague that'd like to speak, and anybody else let me know. Uh, but first, Councilmember Friedson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you uh, to our lead for libraries. Thank you to our uh, education and culture chair. Thank you to all colleagues. I'm kind of out of thank yous here, but uh, really appreciate all the work that uh, has gone into the, the operating budget here. Obviously, our libraries have been a really important part of our communities for a really long time. And I also joined a number of our libraries for a lot of the uh, testing uh, and mask distributions and I would just say that they were done with such a level of uh, organization and professionalism uh, the community was very appreciative uh, I was really amazed and at a time when not everything was working so great uh, honestly in terms of the operations of things and in terms of the community's response the way things operated this really was a a, a, a great example where I walked away feeling uh, a bit relieved and uh, you know and 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 happy uh, with uh, the way in which it was working. So I just wanted to extend my appreciation for all of the teams, all of the staff, all of the volunteers, everybody who uh, had uh, worked and, and participated in that. I, I did just want to raise here because I think it's a broader question that we're we're getting a lot of uh, uh, feedback from community members, understandably about, and we know that it's a it, it's a countywide issue. We talked about the Government Operations Fiscal Policy Committee about bringing staff on uh, libraries as we've talked about it was per particularly hit hard during the pandemic the age of the workforce is quite older there are a lot of vulnerable uh, folks the level of retirements in this department is significant there have been uh, cuts you know fr from the last you know great recession uh, that that we haven't recovered from and then on top of that uh, all of these other you know labor dynamics and uh, I just given COVID, given the coming back from the Great Recession, given all of these staffing challenges, uh, you know, perhaps not today, uh, you know, in the midst of the budget uh, and as we enter, you know, hour three of what looks like it's going to be a seven, eight or nine hour meeting. Um, I, I do think that it would be helpful as we talk about the broader conversation that we already have talked about in government operations and fiscal policy, that we specifically talk about the unique dynamics related to libraries. I don't know if that should be a joint committee between government operations and education and culture, or whether uh, there's another way to do it or whether it's a full council conversation. But I just wanted to note that here because we're getting a lot of feedback 
understandably from from residents as the libraries have come back to full services that they've returned from the other functions that they were doing it's become evident these staffing challenges you know are not really getting any better understandably because of all the challenges that we face so i just wanted to note that here flag that uh, for colleagues and hope that that's something that we can uh, discuss and move forward on appreciate that yeah that's a good point and I, I think this some of this money will help with incentives and things that bring people on quicker but yeah i i think a joint committee would make sense assuming my colleagues and councilman var i know she it makes sense to her she's on both committees so um okay so mr president if, if you don't need a motion so I'll thank you. It to you uh we have a committee recommendation before us regarding the operating budget for libraries all those in favor of the committee recommendation please raise your hands and that is unanimous okay. thank you uh now just turn to uh a memo that i had sent around uh on may 6th and I'll ask Ms. Chen to flush this out a little bit, but basically this is a proposed change to, as we consider the CIP, uh, to the refresh program in the context of the Chevy Chase Library. Um, there have There's an extensive history uh, on the county website of over m multiple years of this project. There was community input, there were proposals put forward, and I would reference, ask anyone to reference those uh, those proposals, but ultimately decision had not been made to move forward with a, a development that would include a new library. There are basically two options on the table. Refresh the library as part of our refresh program, which has done great work, or build a new library because the Chevy Chase Library really is in need of significant uh, improvements. Um, and the, uh, the goal here is this is uh, the proposal that I put forward in the memo and that I'm going to ask us to consider today is that we should just decide that we are going to build a new library uh, as part of uh, the, because the rehabilitation costs so much, and I know we have Mr. Assant here and we have Chen and they can answer questions, but it would be a significant uh, refresh, not as the same cost as a, a complete new library, but one of the most expensive refreshes that we've ever done. Um, and this will be, this site is 0.3 miles away from a future purple line. Um, and it's really a goal of ours, this council has really worked hard and transit-oriented development uh, and making sure that we address our housing needs and goals and putting uh, affordable housing all over the county. Um, and so what the proposal uh, that I've made, sent in my memo and that is in your packet today would be to remove Chevy Chase Library from the refresh list and create a new PDF to create a new library that includes redevelopment that has a housing component. It is silent on what that will look like. DGS will have to work, and I spoke to the county executive earlier this week about this. They will have to continue, which they are doing, get proposals, evaluate them, work with us. This is in the later years, uh, of, you know, 25 to 27 of the CIP, so there'll be another full CIP before, before this even gets going. But I do think it's important to signal to the community and to the public, and there's been a lot of interest in this, uh, that we are going to go in this direction, and that's, uh, that's the policy objective. So, um, I will uh, make a motion to push that forward so we can hopefully start discussion. Uh, moved by Councilmember Juwando, seconded by Councilmember Reamer. Um, I did have a, a bunch of questions and thoughts on this, but um, uh, I know Councilmember Reamer, you wanted to speak, so if you'd like to go next. Thanks. Well, I also had some questions I wanted to ask. So, um, you know, th this is an important opportunity. This is a piece of public land that is in a fantastic place to live right next to other multifamily housing that's quite expensive, um, a short walk to a future high quality transit service right on Connecticut Avenue, one of the corridors in the county that uh, provides access to jobs next to Bethesda, which is, you know, one of our premier job centers. So there's just a lot of good reasons why we ought to be leaning into any opportunity for public land to provide housing. But I just wanted to get at some of the factual questions here. So the library's department and DGS has previously assessed this project and you know, tried to get to the bottom of whether it could be funded through the refresh program. And we have letters from Director Vassallo to the county executive and to the community saying that the amount of work there is so great that it exceeds the 
appropriate cost for the refresh program. So I, I want to qualify the motion a little bit because it's not, it, it can't be in the refresh program. It, it's, it doesn't belong there. It has to come out of there no matter what. Um, you know, if this library is going to get any kind of improvement, then uh, it's going to have to be a much, much bigger project. And so that, that's the question I wanted to ask. If it, when it comes out of the refresh and it goes into a renovation or just a new build, what are we talking about under those circumstances? It appears to me that we're really talking about the need to tear down this library under any circumstance and start over. And under that, circum under that approach, why wouldn't we add a few floors or however much housing is appropriate? On top, it's it's just an opportunity that we would be irresponsible if we didn't take advantage of that. So, um, I think there is some confusion over this. I think there's a, a sense in the community that, well, the county has a couple million dollars, you know, that could be spent, and this facility would become modernized, and and you know, we would address all of the issues about the quality of the HVAC and the lead paint and things like that. That really is not the case. That is not what our building experts have told us. They've said that this building has significant issues and we're, we got to start over. So I just wanted to ask um, council staff for your understanding of the work required and whether this building you know, will can be addressed through the refresh program in the first place, and if not, what that means for us, and we can ask Mr. Austin to come in as well. The analysis that was done with the um, ENC committee previously was not specifically on Chevy Chase Library. So by pulling it out, we've been able to see exactly which years the project was scheduled for and how much. And so we're looking at a number of 5.829, which then we could we requested additional information. This is on um, six and seven, circle six and seven, on the cost per square foot. And that's when the analysis came in of this is much at least to the committee and the, and the council and council members that this is much higher in cost per square foot than, previ than previous places. Um, in terms of the total cost, um, it's estimated to increased to five uh, over 5.8 million, that exact number. I'll let you talk to the experts about, but it was a placeholder at 5.8 million for fiscal year 25, 26, and 27. So, that, but that was thank you. Yeah. That was the refresh placeholder. Yes, and that has not addressed the new anticipated costs, right? right? Exactly. So, we, right. do we have a ballpark of the renovation cost, Mr. Hassan? So, the uh, good afternoon, Greg Austin, Department of General Services. Um, so. Uh, as we do with all of our refresh projects, um, going back to lessons learned from other older uh, facilities, we do a facility assessment up front um, to learn more about the building, basically learning what we're getting into. Um, and that has proven to be uh, good advice um, because we can get an accurate number. Uh, we did do that facility assessment, I think, probably three, maybe three and a half years ago. Um, and I don't recall the exact number, but it was six, seven, and, and once it was escalated and once we programmed it into the refresh queue for 26 or FY27, um, that number would keep getting bigger, as, as, as you well know. So um, that really precipitated the conversation that we had with the executive back in, in 2020 and when DGS issued the solicitation, because at that point the refresh project had gotten to be a number that was closely approaching the cost of a new library. Uh, we have a small site, 20,000 square foot library. We were getting closer and closer to a new library. And so the executive and uh, uh, asked us to, to reach out to the development to community all in an effort to figure out if we introduced some housing to the site, whether we could offset some of those costs. Right. Leverage the, the value of the Chevy Chase Library site uh, to uh, defer some of the costs of a new Library. So, to Councilmember Jawanda's point, um, we really were working with two scenarios: a, a, a refresh, which had really grown to a remodel and perhaps even something more significant than that, or a redevelopment of the site. Okay. And that's very helpful. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I, I think it confirms my 
concern here that we're really looking at the cost of a new library. Whether a housing development there can help pay for the cost of that new library facility to me is unknown. I mean, that, that, and that isn't necessarily the most crucial thing. I think the crucial thing here is that we get housing um, while we're doing the project. So I think that has created a little bit of confusion. I mean, if you set it up and say, can you do some housing here and build us a new library, you get one set of answers. You know, if the county is willing to participate in that housing with HIF funding or with other just costs, then you get a different set of answers. So I, I think we've got to explore how to make housing viable there. Um, and to me, that seems very direct and straightforward. So um, w through the solicitation process, we did we learned two things, really. Uh, the first is that the community was split on uh, a refresh versus a, re uh, a redevelopment of the site. So there was a split in the community. And as Consum Councilmember Jawanda noted, we've got a robust material on the DGS website, create project page, uh, listening sessions, open houses, uh, all throughout COVID. So there was a, a lot of a lot of uh, community input. Uh, and the second thing that we learned, and perhaps more importantly, is that in order to l legitimately offset the cost of the project, we were really looking at a significant amount of market rate housing on the site in a scale that was not consistent with the executive's expectations. Um, uh, folks were, we, we, we purposely issued the solicitation not looking for mid and high rise construction. We weren't interested in that. The executive didn't want that. That was very clear from the very beginning. But um, once we introduced structured parking, um, enough units to, to, to make a project go, we were really looking at a significant number of market rate units, which, which, which quite frankly didn't interest the executive branch. Um, and the community had a lot of issues with it. We have failing Connecticut Avenue already. We have intersections. We have uh, access uh, issues, and it just had a lot of uh, a lot of problems. So, um, the executive's CIP reflects inserting Chevy Chase Library back into the queue as a placeholder, as Ms. Chen noted, um, because the numbers will change ultimately by the time we get to Chevy Chase. But more importantly. At the same time, the executive has directed the executive staff, DGS, and the lead to explore what it would take and what it would mean to do an all affordable, 100% affordable housing in conjunction with a new library. Um, and so that is what we are in the process of doing. I appreciate the, the conversation, Councilmember Jawando. Um, and uh, we expect to have um, um, some updates for the executive and for council uh, in the near term. We don't have them today. Um, but uh, we are starting to get a, a glimpse of what was actually possible and how we might get to an all affordable project in conjunction with a new library. Um, I'll hit the pause button there. Okay. Um, all right. Well, uh, that's been uh, helpful. You know, I, I think the, com the, the executive's comments that there's no value in market rate housing there is, is, is not correct. I, I would love to see a all affordable project um, and, and let's take a look at that. Um, on the other hand, if the count, you know, I, I think we should have all options in front of us. Um, so in any event, okay, I think we've got a good motion here. It says there will be housing and that just sets the expectation so we can figure it out as we move forward. Thanks. I'm going to make a couple comments here and then turn it over to council members Rice and Friedson who are in the queue as well. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. My fault. Councilmember Navarro as well. All uh, right. Um, just a couple of thoughts and comments, uh, sort of abstractly. Um, I I totally agree uh, that we should and and are uh, looking aggressively at all of our existing assets to see if we can identify more housing projects, whether it be affordable, whether it be workforce, whether it be senior. We're also looking aggressively, and actually previous councils passed legislation requiring that there be an assessment done to see if we can find childcare options and opportunities um, on, on public land as well. Um, and so I very much appreciate um, the motion and signaling the interest in ensuring that we 
look at all options, but especially affordable housing, acknowledging the tremendous asset that is the Chevy Chase Library, the fact that it will be so close to the purple line. But I just had a couple of context questions, more for the public who uh, some of the neighbors who immediately live adjacent to this facility have expressed concerns, some of which you've alluded to, Mr. Osan. Um, but if you could just please share with the public, um, as part of the process, there is a traffic analysis, correct? Um, and so this, this, there's a feeling by some uh, that this is uh, being done uh, under the cover of darkness uh, without people's opportunity to provide um, feedback and input beyond what has already been provided. But could you just please walk us through sure. what the process is, which is an important one, that, and, and underscore that there will be more opportunities formally uh, for community input and feedback into uh, projects that you know are going to directly impact them. Cer certainly appreciate that. Um, we are in the very, very preliminary uh, stages of, of, of any project at this point. Um, a, a redevelopment of the, of the site, if that is the direction uh, that the county goes, would involve um, a, a multi-year process of not just uh, preliminary planning and community engagement, uh, but also going through the entitlements process with uh, the National Capital Park and Planning Commission, um, as presumably as a mixed-use project. Uh, county standalone county facilities enjoy mandatory referral. We still get a park and planning. We still have to comply with the with the laws. But as a mixed-use project. Um, there are no mandatory referrals. That goes through the normal entitlements process that any other developer in Montgomery County would be, would, would be required to go through, and therefore all of the regulatory controls, whether it be forest conservation, transportation analysis, uh, and the like. So um, we are, uh, you know, that is several steps ahead if that is the scenario, um, but uh, with all assurances that traffic analysis and all of the customary regulatory requirements we would, we would adhere to uh, in any respect. Thank you. And that would obviously then take into account the Chevy Chase Lake project, which of is, course. you know, uh, not yet entirely completed, but will further expand some of the congestion um, and density that already exists within that area of the county right now. Um, so I just wanted to note that uh, I think it's important. Um, I'm going to yield to colleagues, and then I have some questions that I'll ask as well. Uh, in the I, and I apologize, Councilmember Navarro, you are absolutely in the queue. Uh, I'm going to go with Councilmember uh, Friedson, followed by Councilmember uh, Rice, and then Councilmember Navarro. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you to, to colleagues. I'm glad we're having this conversation, and we've been having this conversation. In fact, my predecessor in 2013, with the support of the prior council. Uh, put forward the bill to require the analysis for co-location of housing uh, and or child care facilities on all public dispositions. And uh, Mr. Assant, you know, because I have been pushing this on a number of sites throughout the county, that it has not gone as well as we had wanted. And I don't believe it has been uh, adhered to with the diligence that my predecessor expected and that I think that the council when they approved that bill expected. We are not moving forward with that. And certainly there are always reasons why we can't do things. And certainly in government we use that a lot. And I'm sure in every situation there are reasons. There's reasons why when I walk around my own neighborhood and look at the second district site for the police station in downtown Bethesda at the center of the most vibrant, you know, uh, uh, urban area of the county, but there's no housing on top of that facility. I don't know that child care would be an appropriate use, but certainly housing uh, would make sense. And it, uh, yes, are there additional costs in security? I'm sure there are, but uh, there's a lot of police officers that be, that would be right there uh, uh, ready ready to, to respond, and, and, and it's a missed opportunity. There's a missed opportunity. We've been having the conversation about uh, uh, the uh, White Flint Fire Station here in the most uh, aggressively pursued area uh, of the county for redevelopment opportunity that the county has been uh, spending uh, over a decade, 12 years, trying to figure out how we can revitalize uh, this area and create the type of urban area at a signature corner. Uh, and there are dozens of reasons why that can't happen. 
And it seems that time and time again, there's always a reason why we can't do it, and there is limited uh, opportunities uh, for, for why we uh, for why we can. So I just wanted to start with that. Uh, we've been working on uh, legislation on this more comprehensively. I do think that this needs to be addressed in a comprehensive uh, way, and uh, uh, we'll share with colleagues uh, that it's been a long time, uh, a, a long time coming. But uh, this issue of this 2013 legislation that has not moved forward. Uh, to the extent that we uh, would want is not a new issue. It's not specific really to this one site or this one uh, community. We need public facilities and we need to co-locate on public land because land uh, is, is diminishing. But I have a couple questions and then a few comments to close. Um, I just want to confirm based on your responses to uh, Councilmember Reamer, Refresh is off the table. Is that essentially what you were saying earlier, or is that still no, something no. that you're pursuing? Yeah, the, the, there's, there's. It would be a very expensive project. There, there isn't a, there isn't a, a dollar threshold that says it can or cannot be in the refresh project. We've had varying costs associated with different projects and that sort of thing. But and the pack, just to know for everybody, the pack, which I appreciate, it shows the cost per square foot. This cost per square foot would be significantly higher than any other project just based on the placeholder right. number which you expect to to go up but it's not as if there's a certain threshold for the correct. square and footage number that would kick you out of a re, you know refresh into right. a we can call you redevelopment know, called by you know we sure. can call whatever we want at the end of the day it costs a certain dollar amount and whether it was broken you know presumably it's called a, a project like that might be broken out into a standalone project that makes a lot of sense and so i understand right. the logic and reason um i just don't you know know definitively that that's the case Okay, so refresh is still on the table. The costs are unknown at this point of what a refresh would look like. We have a minimum, obviously. Well, right, right, <laughs> right, right. It's at That's, least five point eight million. At, at least, and, and we're and, three years out. And what do? You, it, but it's not. I mean, there's always cost overruns in any public project that we have seen, unfortunately, notwithstanding your best efforts. Um, but this isn't really a cost overrun issue of the cost of construction or labor or all the standard issues related to a you know standard cost this is based on the scope of the project itself precisely and you still don't know exactly how much it's going to cost to do all the work that's exactly that's right. going to be needed on top of all of those standard issues right any idea of order of magnitude or you're just not there yet we're just not there yet um in, in fact as i mentioned uh when we did the initial facility assessment which wasn't nearly as um involved as 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 we would normally do if we were closer to construction we would want to dust that off and, and have them take an even, even closer look. Um, but given that that was three and a half years ago, uh, the, the, the 5.8 million is, is, is the base, uh, is, the, is the low end. And we, were, we are, I would imagine that we're probably uh, uh, close, closing in on 10 million um, at, at this point, and it could be even more. Got it, okay. And then um, you mentioned earlier it, it's, that the proposed that you went out with an RFI about housing, that the county executive had certain expectations, and that the proposals that came forward didn't meet the county executive's expectations. What were right. or so, are the county executive's expectations, and have they so changed? So the, the, the original notion was perhaps we could make use of the property, introduce some housing to offset the cost of the project, which we knew was a big number. Um, and we received just that. But the, the scale of the projects, uh, two and 300 unit apartment buildings with a ground floor or library were out of scale um, and it was predominantly market rate. And uh, we understood because that's exactly what we asked for in the expressions of interest, um, but it ultimately um, was, was too problematic for uh, the reasons I mentioned before. Good. Could, could you just help me understand? I'm just trying, uh, yeah. legitimately trying to understand. This is not a trick question. How could an expression of interest from a private party with private dollars not maximize the highest and best use of a site, provide affordable housing that is only provided with levels of subsidy, and help to offset the cost of a public amenity like a library. How could it not? How could it? How, how, it right. It's, it, that's we, we spend tens of millions of dollars. The county executive, to his credit, has included tens of millions of dollars in additional right. affordable housing funding. 
which we all here have recognized is not even enough to be able to subsidize affordable housing because we know on its own, affordable housing doesn't just happen. Right. It gets subsidized with massive amounts of public investments, federal, state, county. Libraries don't just get built. They get funded with public dollars. I, it, it ju I just don't understand, and, and this is part of the, the confusion that I think the community understandably has had of what the expectations actually are and whether those expectations are serious and real. Sure. So initially, back in 2020, we reached out to the development community to help, help us understand what a redevelopment of the site to include a new library would look like. And uh, what we received in response was not consistent with the direction that the executive wanted to go, who then asked us to look at 100% affordable. If we're going to be all in for a library, a new library, let's try to see what it looks like with 100% affordable component, which is the stage that we're in now. It, it, yes, it's a change in direction, um, certainly, from where we were in the way that DGS put out the initial a solicitation and, and expressions of interest. Um, but as, as it noted before, or noted earlier, where we are now is looking at 100% affordable and a new library. And what does that look like? And that's the information we would like to bring back to the executive and council um, and, and explore the costs thereof. Okay, based on the budget language that has been proposed by my colleagues, includes affordable housing. How will the executive branch interpret the language if we approve it here today for the inclusion of affordable housing well 15 percent mpu which doesn't currently exist would that qualify would it have to be additional subsidy beyond what a, a private development how, how specifically would that be uh, interpreted by the executive branch based on what we heard here that you can't right. you can't subsidize a library and afford additional affordability and not maximize the, the highest and best use of the site and, 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 and. Right. That is, that is precisely why the executive staff, uh, OMB is here, uh, DGS, why we have concerns with the edited PDF, because that question that you just asked is, we don't have the answer for that. We don't have any idea how much this is going to cost. We don't have any idea what the affordability mix would be. We don't have any idea what, this, what, the, uh, what the subsidy would be from the HIF or other sources. And we don't know how many units it would be. Um, all we know is that generally we would have about a 20,000 square foot library with 60 to 70 parking spaces and then there's a big question mark above that and that's the information that we've we've we would like to go and get and 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 uh, brief the executive brief council bring that back it's it won't take a year it'll take a matter of months um, but that's why we're we're a little uncomfortable with the language as 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 uh, proposed by council member Jawando because it leaves a very big question mark for us that we just don't know the answer to yet appreciate that so i'll i'll I'll, I'll close on this. I, the, I, um, I think there's a question about how afford, like affordable housing versus housing will be in, interpreted. And I think that's just something we need to figure out. And I do think that if the goal is housing and there's no housing, getting some housing is a benefit. And you know, I, I think that it's easy to you know, always want a bigger benefit and a better benefit, uh, but that's a good way to get nothing ever. Uh, and, and I think we have to be more serious than that. I think that a disservice has been done here, not just with the lack of uh, serious commitment to co-locate housing, but in the mixed messages that have been sent to the community. Whether or not this is a refresh and it could seriously be a refresh, and that is something that uh, is uh, reasonable to be funded in the capital budget, what the timing of this is going to be. Uh, you know, whether or not this needs to be uh, knocked down and rebuilt realistically as its own uh, project and what the timeline for that uh, would be, uh, whether or not, you know, uh, the request for, for interest, if you put out a request for interest and there was never any expectation of accepting anything that could happen in reality, then, then that's unfair and unreasonable and sends a terrible message from the county to the, to the private sector and to the public uh, of whether or not we're really serious partners uh, in these types of endeavors. And I have real serious concern and problems uh, about that. Uh, having said all that, uh, you know, uh, this is not a perfect process. Uh, this is probably not my preferred method. I have the, you know, think legislation and more comprehensive approach. The 2013 bill isn't working. 
So we need to do something else. Uh, but I share the frustration uh, for why this was put forward, that things are not moving forward uh, in the way uh, that, that we would, would want. Uh, you know, I, I think we need to be careful about the county council's budget authority and the county executive's disposition uh, authority. Uh, but we have just missed opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to do this. And, you know, I mentioned uh, the Bethesda police station, the White Flint station. We're still hearing why that can't be done. And I just, I can't imagine being here six years, seven years, eight years from now and having the exact same conversation today that my colleagues were having with my predecessor in 2013. And so, um, you know, for that reason, because our land is scarce, because our housing needs are so great, and because we have made a commitment to do this and we are not following through on it, uh, I'm, I'm willing to try something that even is not perfect, uh, which I admit. Uh, I'm willing to work through the, the details of making sure that it addresses some of the concerns. And I see some nods from colleagues that there may be willingness to do that. But we got to do something. We got to do something different than what we're doing right now because it isn't working. And, and we got to change that. And I look forward to following up with colleagues on a more comprehensive and I think better uh, approach for all of the co-location opportunities that we have around the county because we are not moving the needle to the extent that we uh, that we need to. And with that, I'll yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Rice followed by Councilmember Navarro and then Councilmember Reamers back in the queue. Uh, so, oh, so, sorry, Councilmember Jawando and then Councilmember Reamers. I'm a little bit concerned, Mr. Asa. And the reason why I'm a little bit concerned is because as chair of the Education and Culture Committee, I don't recall a conversation with the county executive about a change in the PDF regarding Chevy Chase Library. Can you tell me if there was ever a time in which you communicated that there was going to be an initiative to switch to a different uh, direction for this project? Because you, you espoused that the county executive had met with community leaders and said that, but uh, to not meet with the chair of the standing committee is a bit of a concern. I'm not, I'm not sure I follow. The, 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 which shift? Did, this was originally part of the refresh project? Correct. And, and, and it still is in still a PDF. Yeah. But you've been marketing it to the community as two options. I'll read an MCM article uh, that states that uh, the county executive uh, seeking uh, input on future Chevy Chase Library and proposed two options to the community, one that involved a renovation uh, project and one that involved a partnership with the county and a private developer. Yeah, that, that was, uh, it, it's been paraphrased, but that's essentially what we issued the solicitation for, expressions of interest to see if a scenario like that were possible. So when did the county executive and executive leadership intend on discussing that with the standing committee that has control and jurisdiction over the PDF for this project? I, I can't answer that. I don't know. Okay. It, it, these are the kinds of things that are concerning because what it does is it does exactly what Council Member Friedson said. We support this project in terms of trying to look for affordable housing in every single way. We're the ones who passed the law to do it. But when we don't have that constant conversation and communication, then it leads to these kinds of disruptive uh, sorts of situations to where it's pitting community members against each other, which jeopardizes the very nature of what it is that we're trying to do. Every single one of us up here wants to see affordable housing in all places throughout this county and it remain committed to that. Um, but I am very concerned about how this has played out. So let me just say this. Um, Shalani and Associates, who I know very well in Gaithersburg engineering firm, they're great, know the owner, um, did, an, did an estimate in March of 2021. So a year ago is when they came up with the 3.7 million. I'm trying to understand how in two years it went, or in one year, it went from 3.7 to 5.8. Yeah. I'm, I'm Shalidia may have done the initial facility assessment. Before. They certainly did it before we issued the solicitation. I think that went out in April of 2020. So, um, but they may have refreshed it or, you know, we, uh, finalized it, or I may have, you know, had an initial draft. But um, in terms of where it goes from three and change up to five, eight, where it's placeholder now, is that the question? Mm -hmm. um, that's simply a matter of adding it. As, so that's that's the construction cost estimate. Once we plug it into a PDF, include all of the county costs and other soft costs, it escalates to that number currently. So, so for all of our PDFs that we have, we're going to have escalations of roughly about 50% in costs. Well, there's a lot more than escalation in those numbers, but uh, to your point, yes. I mean, all of you know, 
the actual cost of construction is not what you see in the PDF. It's it's that's just a, a part of it. Okay. Um, so at this point, um, based on the information that we've heard, um, let me let me ask uh, and, and and Marlene, I, I, I think this Miss Michelson, this is best for you. Um, with us addressing a PDF, um, is there a restriction on when we can change a PDF as as the council? No, you can amend it at any time. Either you can adopt it as part of this budget, or if you feel that you don't have sufficient information, you can come back and change it. Okay, thank you. Um, so, look, as chair of uh, the committee, and I apologize to Councilmember Jawando, he and I have been talking about this, and I support his initiative, but I don't think that we have the information we need to move forward today, nor in the context of budget. With all of the other things that we have, we've been talking about this right now for the period of 30, 45 minutes, and we still don't have answers. Um, so I think that this is not ready for prime time. I would like to see us come back to this, and I would like, as the Committee of Jurisdiction, to claim uh, this issue for the Education and Culture Committee immediately following budget uh, so that we can address myriad of the issues. Uh, if uh, certainly my colleague from Fed uh, would like to participate and make it a joint committee. I'm certainly open to that as well. Uh, but I do think that it is important for us to address this as soon as budget is done so that we can get all of the information uh, so that we can try and move forward with this. So that would be my recommendation. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Navarro. Thank you. So let's see. So we did pass a resolution that we wanted to move forward with new housing targets. I think it's like 41,000 additional units by 2030. Uh, we have s discussed at nauseum uh, during this council term and previous council terms, uh, the acknowledgement that we don't have a lot of space left in Montgomery County. We acknowledge that we needed to take advantage of every single co-location opportunity. That's why we did pass the bills that we passed. Um, we also have acknowledged that libraries are evolving. That uh, when we made you know that decision to co-locate the Wheaton Library with the rec uh, with the recreation uh, community center was because we started to acknowledge that the library footprint itself is really evolving, and we wanted to try something a little bit different. And I remember being so disappointed that we didn't follow through with the Bethesda Police Station District Two because we deliberated on this significantly, and we we continually put ourselves in this very interesting space where we then start talking about, you know, 100% affordable housing and then we lament because, by the way, the park and planning building and the Wheaton redevelopment project also was supposed to have residential on top. As a matter of fact, the uh, negotiation that took place to make that happen was predicated on the fact that there would be residential on top. Oh, lo and behold, the numbers just didn't add up and then we all lamented. And so I just think that we just need to get real. I mean, the bottom line is that the county itself, in terms of our all of these goals that we all talk about, economic development, vibrancy, making sure we're competitive, equity, all of those things are predicated on how we understand the major crises that we are facing regarding the lack of additional housing units. It's very simple. So, you know, whatever the bureaucratic process that needs to take place should take place. I thank Councilmember Jawando for like noticing this because obviously, you know, yes, we should have been able to track this and, and address it earlier. But I am certain that there must be a way for us to move forward with some kind of a new PDF that signals what it is that we intend that we don't longer acknowledge that this is a refresh. I think it's, it's, it's not fair to tell the community that this was supposed to be a refresh. I mean, if we're talking about fiscal responsibility, why would we say that this is going to be a refresh? It's not. And the community deserves better. They deserve a facility that meets their needs in terms of the library. And, you know, we have spent a lot of time, Council Marima, you've worked so hard on this. I know at COG, I've worked so hard to find innovative ways that we can access financing mechanisms to figure out how do we maximize whatever percentage it is of affordable housing that we might be able to get. So this is a prime location. Purple Line is coming. I know there are concerns about congestion, but we also have said that we like transit-oriented development, that we would like to build around activity centers and things of that sort. So it, fit, it checks all the boxes. And I do think that there should be a way to go ahead 
change the PDF so we don't continue to perpetuate this notion that this is going to be a refresh, that we would like to have housing. And the details, as it was just um, shared by, Count, by Ms. Michelson, is that we can always amend once we get into the nitty gritty. But I hope that something does happen because it is disheartening to go through this entire process. And like I said, at Wheaton, we, you know, we just miss the mark there. We miss the mark at the, at the police station. We always find all these very convenient reasons why we shouldn't do it. And then we're all going to be lamenting why the county continues to fall behind on all of our, you know, job creation targets and economic development and all of those things and why other counties are eating our lunch, to be frank. It's all connected. So let's not pretend that it's not and let's figure it out. It shouldn't be that difficult because everybody here is so talented. Um, and let's move forward. So I do support the recommendation and I just would like to figure everybody to put their heads together and figure out what the what the details should be so that we are, are in, in good in a good space. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got three more colleagues in the queue. Just an announcement, colleagues. Let's aim for recessing at 2 o'clock so it gives us enough time before the 3 o'clock by county state agency. And we obviously have three more uh, line items to go through after this one. Uh, hopefully, they won't take as long. But I've got uh, Councilmember Jawando followed by Councilmember Reamer and then Councilmember Katz. Thank you, Mr. President. I think good goal. Uh, appreciate the conversation. I just want to be clear here that the PDF is proposed on page, I don't know what page of the packet, but it was sent around to you, the clean version. Uh, it, it All it does is remove, it does two things that I think aren't affected by what Mr. Assant said, and, I, and I'll give him an opportunity to respond. It says that clearly this will not be a refresh. We're going to move it out um, because the budget before us, the capital budget before us, this refresh was continued. And I think to the points that were made by Councilman Navarro and others, this is going to be at a minimum. And now at the 5.9% cost, it's already around $420 per square foot uh, at the cost that has been admittedly said is not even going to be the actual cost. So it's going to be even higher. So it's not in a refresh. Uh, you know, many of us, this entire council, previous councils have said, the bill was brought up, that we want to co-locate housing and other public benefits like child care at, on public land. I introduced a bill to try to say that that housing should be 30% at a minimum and 15% should be at 50% of AMI. We didn't consider that. That's okay. But we need to have, we all agree in the general thrust that we need to do more of this. And I agree we should have that larger conversation about how to implement that with fidelity. Um, but I just think this was if I if this wasn't raised by the community and and, uh, and then me officially in this context with Long Councilman Reamer, we would have just been we would just be approving a CIP that said we're doing a refresh in 25, 27. I appreciate the the work that's been happening over the last several weeks, but it's been happening because there was pressure, <laughs> you know, yes. and and so I, I think we need to be honest about that. And let's just say, OK, as a policy objective. It's not a refresh. We're going to build a new library, which the citizens and residents of that area deserve, and that we are going to uh, prioritize putting housing there. And this does not get any more specific than that. Um, this just says we want housing. And we can come back. Again, we will have a full CIP before this even is in planning and design. Is that correct, Mr. Hassan, if, it, if the money is moved to 25? That's right. Okay. So we're going to have plenty of time. And so I, I appreciate my chairman's uh comments about the process, I think we're still going to have time here to address it. And we should send a signal that this is not a refresh in this budget. And then we should put the placeholder. All this is is moving the money that's currently in the CIP for the refresh over to a new PDF for a redevelopment of the library and housing component. So uh, did I state that correctly, Ms. Chen? Yes. OK. So I, I just want to bring that up. And, and to the last point I'll make. The co-location has been such a great opportunity at Wheaton, but it's also been great at the General McGee Library at Silver Spring, where we have senior housing there, and it's just a great example. So I think we need to do this at every every opportunity uh, for the benefits to the public um, in addressing our housing needs. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Reamer, followed by Councilmember Katz. Thank you. Uh, well, Councilmember Jawanda stated the record there that I just wanted to make sure was clear, that this was moving forward as a refresh project. And I think the county executive is backing away because there was criticism of putting housing at this location. 
And that's not acceptable. We have to have, have to take advantage of every opportunity that we have, especially in communities where they are such accelerators of opportunity, like Chevy Chase. So we this is a, an important budget amendment, and we have plenty of work ahead of us. Um, but you know, it, it's, it doesn't do any good to talk about co-location and taking advantage of public land if you just take a pass on the most valuable opportunities that you have. And so I, I'm really pleased to support this motion. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I will be I will be brief. I agree that this should uh, not be a refresh, and I agree with housing. But I did have a question, Mr. Assant. When the when when the solicitation that she sent out was was the library going to be the same size as the library is today? How is that going to work? Um, not a hundred percent sure, but I think we're working with about sixteen. 17,000 square feet now, so we're assuming about 20,000 uh, as, as a future, just including a little bit more grossing factor. And were you looking that the county would have no investment in the library, we, we or was it? We weren't, weren't that unrealistic. We knew that we, that we would need to have some contribution. Uh, we were just simply, since the refresh was starting to look like half the cost of a brand new library, mm -hmm. uh, like a tear down rebuild. Um, we thought that we might be able to bring that number down a little bit, but at the end of the day, uh, when you start introducing new, a mix of uses to this particular site, the cost of the project, you know, in, in its entirety, uh, just went up and up and up. And so there really wasn't much of a benefit of, of offsetting the cost of a new library. It just, um, it, 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 again, in, in, in we're going to look at this from an affordable housing perspective, but from a market rate project, it was it, it didn't have the effect that we had anticipated. And, and I appreciate that. I think that we do have to be realistic when we're, I mean, you know, that if, if we want someone else to pay for everything, then they're going to have to come in with a much more dense project than, than what we would have might have wanted or, or maybe do want. The, the other thing is that obviously this area has changed. I mean, it's uh, over the years, and it's certainly going to be changing with more mass transit in, that, in the area. And I think we'd be missing an, a golden opportunity if we didn't have housing there. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks. Uh, so I saved my comments uh, beyond the ones I made earlier for the end. I just want to say a few things just to kind of set expectations moving forward. So um, let me just summarize very quickly. There's it appears agreement along with me that we should be aggressively pursuing options, especially affordable housing on this site. That is clear. Uh, it's clear that the executive branch is already uh, is in engaging in an effort in real time uh, and, and intends to come back uh, at what has been proposed to be a joint committee session uh, to discuss what analysis that uncovers. Uh, Mr. Assant, do you have a time frame more or less? You, you said not a year, but could you be a little bit more specific? I, I think it would be realistic that we uh, be back to brief the council in the fall. Okay. As you're back from, from summer recess. Got it. Um, I also, just for context, we have about, I believe it's over $150 million delta in the CIP right now, as we speak, that this council is going to have to reconcile before we pass this CIP. Um, and if we talk about adding the provision of a full-scale new library with housing on top of it, 100% of it being affordable, none of it being market rate, thereby none of it being underwritten, which would mean the county would be entirely responsible for, possibly through partnerships with the state and the federal government, but through taxpayer dollars to be able to pay for that project, you're looking at a project which admittedly the rent of a, a, a refresh is seven million is ridiculous, um, but we'd be looking at a possible project in the tens of millions of dollars um, that would be added to the CIP as part of this broader CIP context. I just want to confirm: are my numbers accurate? Tens of millions is accurate. Yes. Okay. So, and we will need to figure that out as we always do. Uh, uh, there are. Um, lots of expensive and worth felt projects where often the juice is worth the squeeze, but I just want the public to understand that we're significantly adding to the expense of a library renovation project with, with the, the, the best of reasons, um, but it will have to be fit into an overall CIP 
that is already over 150 million, uh, there's a gap uh, in, in, in how much we're expending and, and how much there already is. And not this, but a future council will have to figure out how exactly that's going to be paid for and where it will fit in the queue. Um, and I'll just underscore once again for the public who has expressed concern about the potential impact on traffic and other issues that there will be an opportunity, um, as is the case formally, as we go through a process for a development such as this for the community to be able to provide feedback. So with all of that as context, I think this is a little bit of six of one, half dozen of the other in the sense that uh, there's universal interest in fully exploring the uh, expanded option within the project um, and we can move the motion now and pass it but we're going to come back to it regardless um, um, in about six months as we heard uh, from the county executive so I completely concur and agree with uh, Chairman Rice's comments about process and this not being ready for prime time um, I think we have signaled through these conversations our intent um, but since there's a motion before us to formally express that interest of intent, I, I, I tend to support it, but acknowledging we've got to come back and, and, and better understand the details which are forthcoming. Okay, so uh, we have a motion and a second before us. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. Clean version. You just clean, the clean version of the motion. All right, and that is unanimous, and we will be coming back to this with more specificity um, in the near term. Thank you. Anything else in the CIP? No. All right, uh, that moves us on to um, the next item on the agenda, which is a discussion of the Office of Grants Management. This was a joint committee session between uh, Health and Human Services and Government Operations and Fiscal Policy. Um, we broke some news. Uh, and I want to congratulate uh, Mr. Murphy on being nominated as the director of this uh, newly formed department. Uh, well, department, is that the correct term, Ms. Chen? No. This newly formed office. Office. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting hungry. Um, so, and I just uh, very quickly um, want to especially thank Councilmember Navarro and her leadership to get us to this point. Uh, she and all of her colleagues and previous councils have been moving in this direction, which we all agree will better leverage county resources, provide a better um, point of contact for our important nonprofit and community-based organizations and partners. And so this was a fairly straightforward discussion. We agreed with uh, the uh, county executive's recommendation and the staff's recommendation, but Ms. Chen, anything I missed? Just to note, because the minutes have not come out yet, the discussion was around um, f having community engagement being a key part of this office, as well as a nonprofit advisory board um, and convening organizations. Thank These you. Minutes and might be very late. <laughs> thank you. And uh, I learned a new term. It was quintupled uh, at uh, the joint committee session an agreement on uh, making sure that there is a formal process by which our nonprofit organizations can provide um, advice and guidance. So uh, there is a Joint committee recommendation before us. Please raise your hands if uh, you uh, agree with that joint committee recommendation. And that is unanimous. Uh, that moves us on to the next item on the agenda, which is a discussion of the CIP cost sharing MCG. Uh, Ms. Chen, I'll turn it over to you to uh, make some comments. Uh, yes, actually, I put the items together um, in, in the pocket. So this is your cost-sharing capital grants uh, PDF that we're used to seeing, as well as the community grants NDA. Should we speak about them separately? Yes, please. Okay, great. So in just speaking on cost-sharing, uh, there the county executive recommended $3 million in cost-sharing capital grants um, and listed this in the CIP description as well as in the community grants NDA. That is historic, a, a legacy, um, legacy practice. Um, the staff recommendation at this point is to delay all cost-sharing capital grants to fiscal year 24 um, for affordable affordability reasons in the CIP and to, one, provide analysis on which programs programs were matched by state bond, building, bond, state bond bill funding to assist programs that did not receive state bond bill funding in fiscal year 23 to apply in the pre next year to also have that be matched and three to provide a racial equity and social justice analysis of the allocation of the funding. And I will just show you guys it's uh, 
it is PDF one, two, three. It is uh, one through six, circle one through six. Uh, thank you for that uh, background and context, Ms. Chen. I very much respect the staff recommendation. Um, I'll just note uh, a few things. Um, the first is, is uh, and, and all of us, I think, at various points have publicly acknowledged the great work of the General Assembly in this session in particular uh, for bringing forward numerous projects that are so critically important, particularly to our nonprofit organizations, to be able to help carry out their work. And we also, of course, uh, express our deepest appreciation to those nonprofit organizations because they are such an important partner to county government on so many different levels. And while I very much respect uh, the interest in seeing if there's a way that uh, this can help us find savings um, and that there be uh, further analysis. I think this brings up, and you bring up a good point, Ms. Chen, that moving forward, I think we should look more systemically um, and in partnership with our uh, delegation and with the General Assembly uh, because they have been very supportive of the racial equity work that this council has done. And we're going to thank Councilmember Navarro till the sun comes home, I'm losing the metaphor, but um, for her work on that, cows come home uh, before, for the sun come up, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, but, um, but it is uh, extraordinary, um, and so I, I, I that, that, that is my perspective and opinion, um, but I will yield to colleagues to share their um, um, thoughts on this as well. Um, but again, I, I appreciate your work. I, I personally agree with the county executive's recommendation to move forward uh, and then commit to, um, at least through my term as council president, coming back to uh, uh, discussing with partners from our state delegation on how we can ensure that analysis moving forward. Um, with that, I have uh, Councilmember Navarro and then Councilmember Friedson in the queue. Councilmember Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I really appreciate uh, that observation. Um, I, I do also agree that at this point in the budget, it is going to be very difficult for us to kind of address this um, because obviously, you know, there's been a lot of work that took place in order to bring these dollars and there's just a lot of expectations. But I do think that it needs to go beyond this council presidency. I think that we should try to perhaps incorporate some language in the budget in terms of our intent and see how we can um, put forth some some way, and I don't I don't I don't know what it would be. I don't know if it's a bill. I don't know if it's a resolution. I don't know what it is, but I do think that it is significant because we do discuss a lot the need to have appropriate support from the state and the difference that it does make uh, for us, given the increased needs and, and given, uh, especially in areas of the CIP supports that organizations do need. However. Um, you know, there's no point in us doing all this work around racial equity and identifying equity emphasis areas and all this kind of stuff if we don't align everything. And so I think it would be great to establish some, some kind of process where we can have a proactive conversation about what those needs are and, um, and really work closely with our amazing members of our delegation to see how we can, you know, best align that. Um, you know, I have seen a lot of feedback on social media, very pointed feedback on the fact that, you know, so many uh, communities um, of color around the, the, the county uh, did not benefit from many of these, you know, dollars. And so it is not a criticism, it's just an opportunity for us to be aligned. Um, and I would very much support that, Mr. President, and the entire council that, that we consider how to enshrine some pro kind of process that we can have that conversation and hopefully um, get to a point where we're, you know, aligned in a much better way. But having said that, I think that at this point, we really need to just approve what we have and, and let folks move forward with whatever it is that they are, are, are doing and, and, and fulfill the needs that they have you know, presently. But I appreciate Ms. Chen for bringing that up. Thank you. Councilman Friedson. Yeah, I appreciate it. I share the views of colleagues. I, you know, I think we're late in the game here to, to disrupt the process now and if there's concerns about the process which i think are reasonable and i appreciate that they've been brought forward and they've been discussed before like they're not new uh necessarily uh but you know we have a packet that came out late last night we have a lot of community partners uh that would have had no indication uh that uh this was under consideration i don't think each of us have even had time to 
uh, fully digest major changes uh, to the process between last night, you know, at eight o'clock and now. So, uh, you know, I, I think we should move forward with the process. And that's just keeping in spirit with what we've done with the community grants. You know, we, we specifically so as not to disrupt the process. And that wasn't just because of this budget year. That's for the last several years uh, as we try to come up with a new system uh, to give time for feedback, to give time to digest, to be thoughtful. Uh, about the way in which uh, we do that. So I certainly don't think we're ready to do that here. I think we should approve as recommended by the, the county uh, executive as has been past practice. Uh, but I do think we have an opportunity. We have a new head of a new office uh, who's looking at all of these issues. We have a racial equity and social justice lens that's supposed to be part of the entire budget. This is part of the budget. Uh, we also have a dynamic here, uh, and cost sharing grants are part of it, where the uh, executive, not just this executive, but executives uh, historically have exerted uh, significant influence over the process. And the council at times has felt that they didn't have sufficient uh, 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 part of that uh, process in terms of the, the, the dollars that we're spending when we are the appropriators uh, of those dollars. I think that's true on community grants. I think that's true uh, on cost sharing grants. I think we need a better process. Uh, but we've got to start yesterday on the process for next year. And that's true. Uh, we had this conversation about community grants. Uh, and we need to make sure that there is a sufficient runway. There are a number of uh, uh, cost sharing grants and commitments that the state has made that we have tacitly or specifically indicated support for uh, that you know have already been decided that we need to honor those uh, commitments. Uh, and we need to you know, really make sure that we're providing the level of runway that is appropriate and the type of communication and engagement that is necessary. And I do think that as we move forward, having a working group uh, like the, um, the steering committee that was discussed yesterday with community uh, grants with nonprofits that includes state partners, that includes uh, OIR, uh, that includes uh, you know, council uh, in that process to figure out how, how we do this. What is the what are the standards that we're going to use to determine what what is matched and how it's matched? When in the process is that going to be decided? Is it through the county executive's budget where we learn when the nonprofits learn whether or not they got matched and our state delegate and senators uh, learn uh, when it gets matched uh, or not? But um, you know, I think there's opportunity to to look at the process for moving forward. I appreciate the fact that. Uh, colleagues uh, have expressed, and I share the view that uh, we're not in a position to disrupt uh, 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 partners at this level of the process, and uh, gives us uh, opportunity to, to work on improving and honing the process for moving forward. Great. So I um, commit to bringing this back, and we'll work with you on that, Ms. Chen. Thank you so much. Again, it's an important discussion. Yes, Ms. Chen. Just on the numbers, I did not include the state ledge update. Of the $250 million that we've received in capital grants from the state, we increased from $13 million to $30 million this year for nonprofits in Montgomery County. That's significant, so which does change the scale of this $3 million. I just want to be clear on that. And thank you to the state delegate for that. Thank you. That's important context. All right. Uh, can I get a motion to accept the county executive's recommendation? So moved. Okay. Uh, moved by Councilmember Friedson, seconded by Councilmember Hucker. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous. All right. Um, was that it, Ms. Chen? Community grants. Yes, yeah, so in the spirit of disruption, the next <laughs> the recommendation also is uh, to change the process late in the game, which uh, I understand is something that we have committed to talk about going forward. But just to be clear, um, the staff recommends shifting any remaining community grants contracts into the departmental base budgets that c currently administer the contract. There's been a three-year runtime to do that, and we are still at an $8 million um, kind of a orphan uh, uh, contracts here. Um, another recommendation to shift youth development grants that serve MCPS students um, to the State of Maryland's Local Management Board, Collaboration Council for Children, Youth, and Families, um, any arts-related grants shifting to 
to the Arts and Humanities Council of Montgomery County and anything else that is remaining to competitively reevaluate remaining um, the remaining contracts in the NDA. Um, additionally, we have $1.5 million um, earmarked here in the Community Grants NDA to provide a new grant process for underserved communities, uh, nonprofit children, youth, and family grants, and nonprofit technical assistance management support grants. The staff recommendation here is just to have another oversight session, either right before, right after budget, or maybe want to give Mr. Murphy a little bit of time to get into his role, uh, and then to discuss a little bit more on the parameters and eligibility of that, and whether that funding is is sufficient for the needs at the time. And finally, and I'll have Mr. Murphy talk about this as well, because community service grants has been a legacy grant program that has been in HHS, it has not necessarily been part, or never been part of the community grants and a process. It is a significantly lower amount of 60,000, so either eliminating the recommendation to either eliminate it completely or put it into the $1.5 million pool that we have um, earmarked here. Mr. Murphy. Mm -hmm. So just to go through the recommendations, and thank you for um, the opportunity to be here. Um, so in terms of shifting grants to the base, uh, to the base budget completely, um, we do go through a, a pretty exhaustive process every year to see what should shift to the base budget every year. Um, what we look for is alignment with other departments, what the department is doing, what their initiatives are, do any of these programs make a good fit. So again, this year we're moving about $2.3 million. Uh, most of that is in HHS. Um, but a lot of the other programs, I think there's a misconception that just because that they're in the community grants NDA means that they're kind of less than. A lot of these programs are very unique. They serve very unique communities or they serve very unique needs and they don't necessarily fit into the stovepipes of the, um, the departments. So having this kind of flexible pool of funding or this flexible area for things that departments wouldn't necessarily do is actually a strategic value. How this, this pool of funding could be used, utilized better, be more strategic, maybe divided up into certain categories and, and competed out separately rather than having every sector compete against each other. I mean, I think that's a very open conversation and one I look forward to having. Um, but in terms of this year, maintaining these funds um, within this flexible pool, you know, makes the, make, makes the most sense because again, it, it keeps things stable for these nonprofits. Some of these programs really don't have a natural home in um, Montgomery County government. And what I mean by that is we have college preparation programs that are useful and very valuable, but Montgomery College, MCPS would be you know, have the subject matter expertise to be having oversight of these. So moving this into a department where they have no subject matter expertise, you know, permanently essentially is, you know, might not be the best strategic decision. I think we have to think about these types of programs. There's uh, workforce training programs, which again, are very valuable. They hit, you know, very unique communities, but, you know, WorkSource Montgomery is probably the best one to be administering these as opposed to, you know, whatever department currently has it. So I think a lot of deeper analysis needs to be put into this, um, looking at where some of these programs belong, are they a good fit? You know, we do evaluate them in terms of how are they performing. Um, there were a few grants that did fall off the list this year because they weren't. Um, but in general, many of these programs are doing their jobs. They're, they're doing okay. Um, and, you know, there's not a big reason to, to cut them at this point. You know, if there's a strategic realignment or we think about how better to use, you know, the significant pool of funding um, and which programs are best to be administered, maybe not by Montgomery County government in the future, but by some of our partners, I think that's a very good conversation to have. And I think the county executive and myself are interested in that conversation. Uh, thank you. Councilman Navarro. How come those conversations haven't taken place though? I mean, we have, that was the whole sort of one of the big pillars of moving towards this, you know, consolidated grants office and the work that we've done for so many years was to also recognize and acknowledge that there are so many particular grants that are going to organizations year after year after year after year after year. And um, the sense was, you know, okay, if they're there year after year after year, it's because they're doing an extraordinary you know, job and many of these populations or issues or whatever that they're addressing are no longer new. Uh, and therefore they really should be in the base budget. Uh, that work should be done so we can make space for other evolving organizations or programs, et cetera, that are addressing horizon issues. So I guess I'm trying to figure out how does this work? I mean, you described it as this decision would mean cutting those programs. 
so Ms. Chen, in terms of what you are recommending, how, how, how would this transition work? Um, and I, I'm just, you know, a little bit frustrated that here we are still having the same conversation. And you say that, you know, that you guys are willing to get together and to think about, you know, analyze, well, how come you didn't do that? I mean, it's not as if this is new. Mm -hmm. So so when, when you're making that recommendation, Ms. Chen, um, can you elaborate a little bit more on what then, what are the implications for these programs? Because I just heard we don't want to cut them. Right. So if we, and these are the links to the previous, this is in the Office of Grants Management, our discussion starting in 2019 um, about how to consolidate two processes and to propose legislation for a central office. It was to clean up the NDA and to um, sort of call them legacy grants or grandfather grants that would been there for over well over a decade uh, in annual contracts. And the discussion at that time was, can we move to a two or a three year multi-year contract at least, um, or at or have them move into the base? Mm -hmm. um, the first year we were moving, you know, uh, I have the numbers, three million, four million into the base from this NDA. Um, last year was 711,000, which is the pressure and the push this year to push to put in more. So two million still makes it. But without these departments signaling that they will take it into the base, there is no loss to anyone in terms of service, in terms of funds. The funds would be transferred to the base budget of the department have full control. Um, you still have eight million dollars of contracts um, that seems to be signaling that it's, it's not significant to the mission of the particular department that's been administering for over 10 years. So if we went with your recommendation, then I'm hearing you say that there, there are basically, there'll be orphans because they don't have departments that could provide the oversight that they don't have a home in Montgomery County government. So I'm trying to reconcile those two things. Well, I apologize if I left the impression that they would be cut because they would not be. It's that when they are in an department based budget, the department has full oversight of that program. You know, it's not centrally. Yeah. It, watched over it has been by OMB or, or a council. It's just part of their budget. It doesn't appear anywhere. Um, and so then the department decides how they're going to prioritize it, you know, okay. as they face cuts or they face realignments within their budgets. So if they take on a program that they have no subject matter expertise in to properly oversight and, you know, they do face a savings plan, they do face a realignment, you know, the programs that they're probably going to eliminate are ones that they don't understand. So then we will never migrate anything because yeah. By you know, by that logic, then we are, we're never going to migrate. So, so it's like I don't even know why we're having this conversation. <laughs> I mean, if the executive is saying that there is no way that because they don't have subject matter, you know, experts, and so therefore they're just going to let them go, then then I that, guess go back to square one. I don't know. No, it, it's that they uh, apologize. It's that they should remain within the NDA in this flexible pool of funding that the program should yeah, be. Yeah, I understand that, but you know, but, again, a lot of the things in there are are programs that have been providing you know key services to. Communities that now are not no are no longer emerging communities are no longer emerging issues, and that's why we wanted them to be part of the base. That was the whole point. Um, so, from my perspective, I feel like we just need to make a decision. I, you know, I generally agree. I, I mean, I agree with all of the staff recommendations because this is not a new conversation. I, 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 it's just frustrating to have to like act as if we just discovered this and, and now we're going to do it. So that. I would support the staff's recommendation. Thank okay. A um, couple of thoughts here. Um, none of this was discussed in the joint committee session yesterday. It, it wasn't, um, and we're talking about it in real time now. There are some significant recommendations in the staff recommendation, uh, as an example, shifting all arts based programs and services to arts and humanities, which in principle I understand, but there are programs and services that don't fall perfectly within the realm of arts and humanities that are after school programs in the STEM field. So does that mean that arts and humanities will then be responsible for coordination of programs that go in within Excel Beyond the Bell and those organizations are gonna to have to shift whom they are going to request funds for and will that shift the process and while I also, again, understand and respect the recommendation to shift youth development programs, um, all of them over to the Collaboration Council for Children, Youth and Families, again, having, having been the director of one of the former departments that manages a lot of those programs and services, 
aligning them and coordinating them and better leveraging the with programs and services that are on the ground are significant. So I'll be candid, Ms. Chen, it's 2.05, uh, and we have to break to um, um, have a discussion um, regarding the bi-county, and we've been going through, and, and this staff needs a break. I don't know that, I'm, I'm, I have a lot of questions about this, and so I'd like to propose that we shelf this particular item and come back to it. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but I, I understand the intent, I just, you know, it's inappropriate in real time right now. There are a lot of organizations who are gonna be impacted by this. Um, and I wanna make sure that um, I, I, uh, we're, we're able to talk a little bit more about it. So um, um, we will, um, can I get a motion to table it for now? So moved. Moved by Council Member Hucker. Um, and so we will uh, come back to this um, in due time, in, in, in short order, um, but give us a little bit more chance to express. No motion, all right, got it, got it. Got it. We're not going to act on it now. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. With that, we are adjourned until 3 o'clock. Your agenda.